apartment bill that they need. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Cameron Smoke, Assistant Commissioner of Consumer Protection, Georgia Department of Agriculture. Um, this is a very simple little bill. Uh, we hear that, a but it really is. The um, pasteurized milk ordinance is what we operate under to um, regulate the Grade A milk program here in the state of Georgia, and the Interstate Milk Shippers Conference meets every so often, and does some adjustments to it or changes it or whatever. And this version 2005 is the most current and we need to update our statutes to reflect that version. Thank you, Cameron. Anybody got any questions? Mash your button, Ellis. I don't know where. Cameron, uh, uh, what's, why is this bill needed? If I read that last sentence in there of that uh, section that's already in the code, says the commissioner, uh, has authority to make these changes? Well, we were advised several years ago, rather than putting language in there that says all subsequent editions, that we needed to put the, the year and adopt that so there wouldn't be any questions. That's just I'm, some, I'm, you know, I'm, some of our internal advice. Academic question, but yes. You want to it would make it easier, but I, I think probably, and in, in, you know, some of the attorneys may address that, but it they just feel like it's better if we come back and, and update and put that particular date year in there. Well, my question was the same as Representative Black. I was going to say, why do we need to change? It's there. It needs to be there. And uh, we'll put it now for 205 and 208. We're going to come back and do the same thing again. If the commissioner's got the authority to do it, why have to change the dates? That's the same as Black guys. Ms. Mr. Chairman, I don't know, maybe Wayne. Is that you, Wayne? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? I don't, I'm going to smash your button over there. I can't hear you. <coughs> I'll try it, see. Yeah, all right. Chairman, it's to avoid a, any question of a delegation of legislative power, it's, it's better to change that date and let the General Assembly do it as opposed to the Commissioner doing it by rule and reg. One thing, I'm not, I'm not sure how lengthy codifying the entire standards would be, and uh, you, it's my understanding that those standards still need to be updated from time to time, and once you put them in the code, you'd have to rewrite them, you know, have the same effect. Mr. Chairman, this will take care of your problem if we just pass this, won't it? Yes, sir. That's the bottom <laughs> line. If you would do that, I would appreciate it. Chairman, at the proper time, I'd make a motion. Sounds pretty good about now. <clears throat> I'd make a motion if it did pass. Got a motion, second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Oh, no. Thank you. Gene's going to handle this on the floor. Bill uh, 1393 is a biodiesel the definition. Representative Hill is stuck in traffic somewhere in this city. Uh, so, Representative England is going to handle the bill for 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This basically just sets up a definition for biodiesel fuel. Uh, we've been working with folks from all over the state trying to come up with, with a definition that's as inclusive as possible for anything that may be used in the future manufacture of biodiesel other than things that we know of now. Basically, it states that biodiesel fuel means a fuel composed of monoalkyl esters of long-chain fatty acids derived from wood and wood residues, <coughs> crops, residues, stover, agricultural waste, or animal fats, with each production run meeting the requirements of American Society of Testing and Materials Standard D6751. Uh, that standard is pretty much the industry standard for, uh, uh, for production of biodiesel. And biodiesel fuel just refers to the B100 portion uh, of, of that, of that uh, fuel. It doesn't, we're not calling biodiesel fuel a B2, which would be a, a biodiesel blend. But this is just mainly reflecting the definition for a B100 fuel. Anybody have any questions? First, let's have to make sure that wood chips can be part of that, right? Right. It wasn't clear on this. The, uh, the, the substitute that was handed out came from the general committee, general subcommittee on ag uh, that includes the wood and wood residues. Mr. Chairman, at the proper time, I'd so move. Got a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed no. All right. House Bill, uh, Lord, I ought to know the number of many emails I got on. 1424. Where's the Representative Smith at? Thank you, uh, how, how about, Tom, how about coming down here where the yeah. mic is so they can get you on TV? All right, be on television. Yes. Used to, one time with a Cub Scout down to the Ranger Howl program on Channel 4 out of Jacksonville. I don't know if any of y'all ever watched that. We were on television back then as a little boy. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for hearing us today. We appreciate your working with us on this legislation. Uh, it may be of some comfort to the committee to know that this whole crowd is not going to talk today. I think we got it narrowed down to about five, haven't we, Kay? Five or six. So they and they're going to not be. They'll be brief. Um, first of all, uh, uh, I have. We got two legislators present that want to take uh, make some comments as a part of my time. Should they come uh, later after I finish, or you want them to come on up and sit with me? What's your preference, Mister? Whatever Mr. you want to do. Y'all want to come on we up? Kinda, we kind of like a church picnic in here. Huh? Right? I said, we kind of like a church picnic in this committee. We don't try to run it like a... Well, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, as you can see, uh, this is probably one of the few opportunities that you'll have to this uh, session to vote on a bipartisan bill. Uh, you've got uh, it's a combination. If you look on the, on the uh, sign-up of the authors and also uh, uh, what's... Evident today, uh, Mr. Williams representing the Democratic wing of the legislature, and Mr. Mosley and I, the Republican, and we're united on this effort. Let me say that um, I don't know how many of y'all remember back years ago uh, growing up, but there was a lot of uh, World War I veterans come back and they had a peg leg, wooden peg legs. I, a lot of them went around with wooden peg legs. And uh, back in the, right after the war, uh, over there close to where I live, there was a feller, uh, they were out coon hunting. Back then we didn't have deer roaming like we do now. Uh, you had to go to the coast to do any deer hunting, but they had a peg leg feller and a bunch of his buddies were out coon hunting one night, raccoon hunting. And uh, they, uh, uh, if you know anything about, uh, about hunting uh, raccoons, they, uh, they, if they're not going to, if they're going to move at all, they'll move right before daylight. That's that's when their most active time of moving is right before daylight. Well, they'd had a dry night and they'd all got sleepy, and it was uh, about this time of year, and they was in a plowed field, and uh, they'd had them a little fire there going, 
And the feller with the pig leg had, uh, in the sleeping, had rolled over his, his wooden leg in the fire and burned off about that much of his uh, wooden pig leg. Well, uh, sure enough, just for a day, the dogs treated a coon. Well, pig leg feller said, uh, boys, I know where he's at, follow me. And he got about like from here to that wall, cross running across that field, and he turned around and he said, uh, be careful, fellers. There's a hole every other step. <laughs> of course, he thought there was a hole because part of his leg, uh, Penny, was burned off, what it was. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, we... Uh, we're uh, we've had a whole every other step with this effort. We've been we've been fighting these issues for three years. There's a lot in this legislation that uh, doesn't uh, doesn't doesn't do near what the, this group would like to have done. This is just one one little tidbit, one little crumb that that uh, that we're offering uh, this group this morning, this particular morning, this meeting, and. Um, it, uh, but it, it is something very important to them, and they're very appreciative for, for this. Uh, what all this bill does is it says that uh, uh, hunters who uh, use dogs and hunt for deer will be treated the same way uh, all other hunters are treated, fox hunters, coon hunters, rabbit hunters, what have you. If you, if you went out uh, hunting coon or rabbit or you just have your own dog, uh, and he he strays off of the. You're uh, out hunting, and he strays off. Uh, then uh, you're not charged to fine or uh, took to jail or anything like that. Uh, you can't go on the property now without permission, and this doesn't let you go on the property. It keeps that in place, but but you're not fined just because your dog goes on the line, except for deer hunting. That's the only. Uh, hunting that the department requires it, and they, they, I think the world of the commissioner and the director of the game and fish, they're both friends of mine, but they're wrong on this issue in my opinion, and that's why I'm here before you today. Uh, it's not fair to single out deer hunters and treat them different than you do all other hunters. I, uh, I first of all asked the legislative council just say they'll be treated like everybody else, and he said, well. <laughs> don't want to do that because then they may treat everybody else like they do the deer hunters. So uh, make make restrictions on the coon hunters. So that's why it's written, written the way it's written. But that's all it does. It says that uh, when uh, – and, and think about it. When, uh, when you're out hunting, I, I, I don't, I've never done any dog hunting, but I've done some steel hunting. But, but I've done bird hunting. I've done a lot of bird hunting, uh, quail. And if you know anything at all about a dog, a dog, when they're out hunting, doesn't know where the boundary lines are. I mean, they, they just don't have the ability to know uh, this is John's land, and he doesn't want me hunting, and this is, this is uh, the part that I can hunt on. So occasionally they will stray off. And what has happened now, the department has got this rule that they can be fined, and they'll tell you more detail about all the horror stories about that. And... Uh, Department may say, well, we hadn't done that much lately in finding them or this or that or the other. But the thing about it, if we walk out on the streets of Atlanta tonight and a fellow comes up and puts a gun to our head, he may not shoot us. But it makes our evening very unpleasant and to know that that threat's there. And so this is just fair government is, is all this is. And uh, I hope you adopt it. It still leave, leaves this uh, particular legislation, leaves everything else intact as it's written now. Except, except for that one little change, and I uh, hope you'll support it, and I'll yield the rest of my time to uh, uh, Mr. Mosley and Mr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you look out on, on the group that's behind me, you will see that they're just like you. You're all farmers and, and people that, that uh, love uh, uh, your dogs, and uh, there's one thing in, in South Georgia you don't do, and I'm, I'm sure it's all over the state, you don't mess with a man's wife or you don't mess with his dog. And uh, our folks are just like you on that. 
And uh, we uh, we appreciate you. I, every one of you I consider my friend. And uh, I think that you know that I shoot it to you straight. So I hope that you'll, uh, you'll rule like I would rule uh, in favor of our hunters. Mr. Al, hang on just a second. I want to make sure everybody knows. I should have said it beforehand. We're working on LC 254488S. It's a substitute that, that the author brought to us. I, I saw some of y'all looking at the original bill. Go ahead, Mr. Al. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hate to disappoint you, but I'm neither a farmer, don't do much hunting, and I certainly don't chase anybody's wife. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> we're all on television, don't <laughs> but, <laughs> and I, Your wife watching I you. Know, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, um, <laughs> I certainly know that it was difficult for you all to make me out with all my cousins back here, and it was hard to see me. But, <laughs> But uh, I represent Liberty County, of course, and a lot of deer dog hunters live in my district. And I consider the districts around me all the way up as part of that same group of loyal deer dog hunters. Now, any time a group of people leave home 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and they're not hunting coons to come to Atlanta, Georgia, then that shows the commitment they have. And I think this is a reasonable request that the deer dog hunters of this state be treated the same as other hunters. And it is quite a problem now because as Representative Smith has said, a dog has no way of knowing when he's crossed the boundary, especially when he's in hot pursuit. Now, I don't know whether we still do it, but you still under hot pursuit, you could follow a car if you were deputy sheriff over county lines. But dogs can't do that. So I'd sure like to see us at least have the right of hot pursuit and with permission of the landowner be able to retrieve your dogs. Just just the fairness of the issue. I appreciate your time. I've got a quite a contrasting schedule. I'm leaving a bunch of do deer dog hunters to go meet with a bunch of preachers. It should come to some conclusion this morning. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, in conclusion, let me say that this group is only representative of a much larger group. They're the, they represent the heart and soul of rural Georgia uh, in hunting. And uh, we had a meeting down in the district I represent. Uh, Mr. Mosley has it now, Blackshear, about a year ago. Al was there. And Al, I think there was, what, 5,000? 5,000 people on a Saturday. And it was good dog hunting. It was kind of a good dog hunting day that day. The weather was good. And they came to this meeting. I knew then we had a real need to address this issue. And so, again, thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee, for hearing us out this morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. William, Mr. Mosley. Thank you all. Does anybody have any questions for any of the three? Mr. G? Uh, let me start out by telling you this. I have coon hunted when I was a young boy, possum hunted, and... Then came down to South Georgia and started running deer with dogs and so uh, fox and so forth. And I want to tell you all a little humorous tale. Must have been Prince, an old friend of mine, and he'd fox hunted for years and years and years and lived to be nearly 90 years old. And I asked him one time in my veterinary hospital, I said, Must have been, I understand you've been uh, fox hunting for about 70 years. He said, Oh, no, about 10 years. I said, Why? He said, The rest of the time I spent hunting my dogs. <laughs> so, 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 so the dog. The dogs are going to get out. So I'd like to ask uh, Smith, uh, isn't it true that a good, well-trained dog is going to pursue his game, Representative yes, Smith? Yes, sir. You're exactly right. And, 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 and isn't it also further true that a good, uh, well-trained dog, the hunter has hunted him enough, he knows his voice, and there can be a bunch of dogs running, and he knows where that dog is. Exactly. He can follow him. And so he can, as long as it's audible sounds, he knows which way he's gone. If he happens to go down and cross a river and goes out and he loses audible, he knows which side of the river to go looking for, right? Yes, sir. You're so exactly I think, right. And I think he needs to go get it. Being a doctor of that, I'm sure you know better than anybody in this room. I, I agree totally. Alex? I'll add one other question for uh, Chairman Smith that uh, the good doc looked over. 
Is it not also true that most of these hunters have tracking devices on these dogs, and even if they're not trailing? That's they correct, and I think and they're going to address that when they get up. But you're exactly right, and I appreciate you bringing that out. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions for them? All right, thank you all. Thank you. The way we normally do this testifying stuff, uh, I'll just go down the list and, and, and call out your name. And, and if you don't mind coming up here to the mic. That might be better. We're going to move the mic so you don't have to wiggle around all them chairs and stuff. Uh, evidently, Mr. Joe, is it Worley? Who signed up first? He wrote his name down before I said right where I could read it. Yes, Wiley. Okay. All right. If you don't mind coming up there, I'm sorry. There's about 21 people. So, you know, it kind of, I ain't going to cut you off, but. Well, I'm going to be brief. Uh, I'm probably the, the only out. Outlaw or, or misfit in the whole bunch. I am an archer, uh, but in in the sport of archery and deer hunting with with the bow and arrow, uh, we also don't make excellent shots all the time. We do make mistakes, and we also need our dogs to to blood trail and, and find the game, uh, and, and 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 retrieve it so that that we can all eat from what God's given us to eat from. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? I need to ask you, you still hunt, but you want a dog to be able to track a deer. Yes, sir. That you just yes, sir, wounded deer. Okay. All right. So you're not opposed to the bill, what I mean? No, sir. Okay. I'm 100% okay. in favor of it. All right. Please don't mistake that. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Donald. H-A-L-E. H-A-L-E. Yeah, that's what it says. I'm Donald Hale, and I'm probably one of the older hunters here. I've been hunting about 40 years, and always hunted with hounds, uh, fox hunting, deer hunting. And I know the problems that can arise from running dogs. And uh, I hunt in the area down around the West in Clinch County in Brandon County. And uh, I'm in four different clubs down there. And, uh, if y'all can help us with this, uh, there'd be a lot of people down there be really appreciative. Anybody have any questions for Mr. Hale? Thank you, sir. Robert Osborne, Ald Osborne, Osborne. Uh, I'm a uh, dog hunter. I'm from Pierce County, and uh, I kind of represent the people from the Pierce County Hunting Club, which we have about 75 people in the club. And you're talking about those trackers. I mean, we, we've got something like maybe $1,200 in these trackers trying to keep track of our dogs. We don't want them to go off our property because, you know, the dog will be gone, you know. we got to go hunting then. But uh, this bill here, you know, it's very unfair to us because, you know, we cannot get our dog. I mean, we can't keep our dog from going to, on somebody else's property. And we don't want to go on their property. But we, you know, we can't be fined. You know, if we get fined two or three times, we'll just have to quit hunting, you know, dog hunting. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Lowell Schumann. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. I'm from Waycross, Georgia. I'm vice president of Still a Hunting Club down in Branton and Camden County. We, I represent 40 members. They all in support of this bill, and I'd like to plead with you this morning if you'd help us support this bill. I'd appreciate it, and thank you for your consideration. Thank you, sir. Any question? Mr. Jimmy Flower. My name is Jimmy Flowers. I'm from Pierce County. I hunt in Ware County. Bennett Bay Hunt Club, 108 members. I do ask you to support our bill and our cause. Not for us, but for maybe our children in the future. Maybe if we, we can kind of turn this thing around and, and get it going our way where they'll have something to do like, like we grew up doing. Any 
Any questions? Thank you, sir. Charles Harris. I am Charles Harris. I'm from Brantley County. I'm a farm for a living, but I also enjoy hunting, fox hunting, deer hunting, anything to do with a hound. And we certainly need this, need y'all's help in getting this thing passed. It's going to mean a lot to us. Like Jimmy said, if we don't do something right now, start something, we, uh, our children may not never know the enjoyment we've had enjoying our woods around our places around there. Thank y'all. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Uh, Scott Hartley. My name is Scott Hartley, and I represent the uh, Fendig Hunting Club in Bradley County, and we just hope you support this bill. Anybody got any questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Eric Buchanan. Did I not say? Oh, okay. Hey, I'm Eric Buchanan. I'm also from Pierce County, and I'm also representing Pierce County Hunting Club, and uh, we hope you'll support us on this bill. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, sir. It just says Jimmy and Gator Bay Hunting Club. Jimmy Horn from Camden County, representing Gator Bay Hunting Club, and uh, we need some support on this bill, and we certainly appreciate it if y'all would help us. And uh, that's about all I got to say. Thank you. Anybody, anybody got a question? Thank you, sir. I'm Larry Jordan. I live in Alma, Georgia. I'm a deer hunter, and I rep represent Marshawn Hunting Club, and I hope you all support us on this bill. Any questions? Thank you, sir. <coughs> Charles Brooke. <coughs> um. I'm Charles Brooks. I represent Big Swamp Hunting Club of Ware County. We we have 125 members in our club. We should, hope y'all support us. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Vernon Jowers, and I'm from Blackshear. I grew up fox hunting all my life. <clears throat> my granddaddy wrapped me up in a blanket and took me at an early, early age. Over the years, I have heard, I have really enjoyed hearing packs of hounds uh, run a fox. And uh, we didn't feel like in the early ages that we would ever have ever have these problems and ever have these stipulations. But I can honestly say that the, the hunters in South Georgia, and we're talking about 41, uh, about 41 counties, we have moved up to the technology stage where we run tracking collars on our dogs, we run shock collars on our dogs, and uh, we, we have the CB radios and, of course, uh, the, uh, uh, the links and everything trying to, to work and, uh, and keep control of our dogs. One of the things that I would like to bring out about dog hunting is this, is the fact that 
Dog hunting is probably one of the few sports that the whole family gets involved, ladies and gentlemen. Most, uh, most of the time when you go, uh, go to a uh, hunt on Saturday or whatever, a gentleman has his wife and has all of his children and everything. They'll be scattered all over the tops of dog boxes and everywhere. So it is a, fa it is a family tradition that's been carried on for years and years. And if you'll check, I think you'll find that, uh, that the rate of the license sales in the state of Georgia has been going down, down, down every year. So something's not working. We encourage you today to let's turn this thing around and let's put things back to working like it once did and let, so that we can have the youth and the family, and the family atmosphere. And you'll see more people get excited and enjoy hunting a lot more by it being a family tradition. And let's get the license sales back up. Let's don't let it continue to go down. Let's educate our youth. Let's educate other folks. And let's get it moved back up. I'm in support of this bill, and I hope you are. And may God bless you. Thank you. Hang on just a second. Has anybody got any questions? Yes, sir. I have one. Uh, you talking about license sales? You talking about big game license or regular hunting license? I'm talking permits? about I'm talking about license sales in general. That's correct. But not dog permits is what. You're no. Saying. Okay. That's but dog. But uh, but you are exactly right. When we started, I'm one of the original founders of the Georgia Hunting and Fishing Federation. When we started, uh, within two years, we have had over 100 clubs in the state of Georgia drop out from what it what, what it originally was. That's how fast that it's dropping. Over 100 clubs in the last two years has dropped out and are no longer dog hunting because because of these bills. Oh, uh, hi, man, hang on just a second. Let me get there you go. All right. Sir, what, what size are, are your normal size clubs? I mean, acreage-wise. Most of the uh, most of the clubs in our area range anywhere from. 8,000 acres, and I think uh, we've got some that's uh, 30 and 40,000 acres. But uh, very, very few clubs uh, are any smaller than 8,000 acres. That's 8,000 contiguous acres. That's 8,000 contiguous. It's got to be contiguous acres. That's correct. Over all, he says, over all of the the entire state that averages 4,000 acres. But most of them, down, when I'm talking about down in our area, I'm talking about uh, Pierce, Brantley, Ware, uh, Clinch, those, uh, those areas down there. Some of, some of the areas up north of us uh, are smaller, but most everything in our area is around 8,000 and better. Do, do you have any idea how many complaints a year are filed pursuant to the Code section that you're trying to amend. I mean, are there a lot? Or is I, it a I, I will yield, if, if you don't mind, sir, I will yield this to, uh, that that's what I'm saying. I will yield, I'll yield this to, uh, Mr. Reggie. He can, uh, he can an answer those questions. He's got the, uh, precise, uh, answer. Thank you for taking a minute to answer some questions. Thank you. Uh, Ronnie Gaskin. My name is Ronnie Gaskins. I'm from Bering County, uh, Miss Houston's home home county. And uh, I just want to uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and you members of the Agriculture Committee for hearing our case this morning. I'm about as nervous as a, a long-tailed cat in a house full of rocking chairs. Uh, we did leave this morning at uh, uh, 3 o'clock in the morning to drive up here and... Uh, and uh, uh, I was doing well till we stopped and eat in Forsyth, and my driver handed the keys to me. <laughs> so, uh, so when I got up here in this this traffic, uh, that finished me off. And then standing up here, uh, I appreciate you, Mr. McCall, trying to to take a little of the tension off there, and because uh, uh, I'm not no spokesman, I'm a mechanic. And uh, but I, as far as agriculture, I was very fortunate to only be old enough to lay on them cotton bales and sleep. 
when when my parents was out there picking cotton. And then I was, by the grace of God, fortunate enough to have my father take me deer hunting and uh, deer dog hunting. He started out having to drive to Brunswick to find a, a deer dog hunting club. And then later on, uh, started hunting in Clinch County. And there I... Uh, I was able to sleep on the dog box uh, many a days while they was hunting the dogs, just like um, uh, was brought out earlier. But um, I've also had the pleasure of, of taking my kids and letting them sleep on my dog box. And I hope that I'll be able to uh, take my grandkids and, and, allow, and allow them the same opportunity that I've, I've had given to me. Uh, but this morning... Uh, I would uh, plea for your help concerning the dog hunting permit. And this is the original bill was House Bill 815, Section 11. And um, in that, that bill, it, it said that the property had to be permitted and the dogs had to be permitted. And then after that, when the regulations come out, it come out with the fact that the dogs couldn't get off the permitted property. And um, so... This is what our, our Bill 1424 is entertaining, that part about the, the dogs getting off a of permitted property being a finable offense and something that can cost us and is costing us. And uh, the figures that, that uh, uh, we've handed you all show some of the economical impact that dog deer hunting clubs has on the state of Georgia. And um, uh, in the past two years, since 2003, we have lost over a 100 a hundred dog hunting clubs um, and it's it's from different reasons some of the landowners have got nervous uh, since this law has come into effect they've they've uh, uh, taken up the the leases some of the uh, the dog hunters is going to other states uh, a lot of them going to South Carolina and, and other states uh, uh, to hunt deer because of, of this law and then and then others are just scared that they if their dog gets off of the permitted property, they'll they'll receive a fine, or because of this law, it cost their hunting club uh, uh, their lease. My club has 14,000 acres, and and we have 40 paying members and 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 some honorary members. We uh, we're fortunate enough to give our older members an honorary membership once they they reach 65. And and uh, uh, but as as y'all can see from the figures that that we handed out there, uh, that. And that is confidential information. If any of you call my wife and tell her how much money I'm spending on, <laughs> on dogs and hunting, uh, I, I'm I'm not going to. Just don't let her look at the TV because you own it. You. I, I just thought about that. We we, <laughs> we cut we cut our own throat, don't we? <laughs> but uh, anyway, it just just those are very conservative figures. The figures that I put come up for my own club was a lot higher than that uh, and uh, uh, given the, the I do have more members than, than some of the average average clubs but I don't have near as many as some of the clubs neither but uh, just given the 100 clubs that we've lost that's that's almost 17 million dollars of revenue the, that uh, the state is, has lost in the past couple of years and uh, with that I just urge each of you to su help support this House Bill 1424 Mr. Jackson, we got a question for you if you'll take a second. Evan? Well, I was going to ask the prior one, but I'll ask this fellow because he looks like he, he needs a question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of the, uh, I was wanting some explanation as to your judgment on the loss of these clubs. How many of them resulted from that bill that uh, was enacted some time ago and, and because of the size restriction? Now, I know we came back, I believe it was last year, the year before, and uh, amended the bill to uh, allow people to hunt on, if, if they own the land, they could hunt on the land themselves with less acres. But how, how, how many of the clubs was lost out because of that 2,000 acre size restriction? In, uh, the size restriction, I feel like, Mr. Black, in the, the very first year cut out uh, a, a great number of clubs because of the 1,000 acre continuous acres. This bill last year that gave us relief and brought it back to 250 just for private landowners, uh, it, it didn't bring us back in but very few clubs. And uh, so the answer to your question would be very few 
from from the original clubs that was permitted, which was 458 in, in 2003, the original clubs that was permitted, uh, reducing the acres to 250 the acres didn't didn't help us a whole lot. Mac, I got a couple of questions that you may can help me with. In in the proposed bill, when you break it down, there's about five different provisions in here. Of the, I'm, where Representative Smith? Tom, Tom. He's right here. Yeah. Let me let me ask: Is is a substitute? You mind me asking him a question, Mr. Chair? No. Is a substitute going to be what's going to be offered, or? Yeah. yeah okay. The, I mean, we. I, I guess my question to you, Tommy, uh, Representative Smith, are we working off the substitute? Yes, sir. It, uh, that was a agreement with the chair and I. The uh, uh, the working off the substitute, okay. and uh, that's uh, that's that's what we're requesting y'all to consider. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. The, the last provision in here says that no hunter shall enter upon such other track to retrieve or pursue such dog without first obtaining the permission of the adjoining landowner. What? How much trouble is that? Are you getting? Are you having trouble going onto the properties to retrieve them? Uh, no, sir. It's very, very few. Um, and in my fourteen thousand acres, for instance, I mean we've got landowners all all around us. Uh, we have one. One place that's across the creek that's um, the guy on about a hundred acres that, that he doesn't allow us on his. But if we wait and, and he don't catch the dogs in five minutes, they're off his property right. anyway, and we well, catch them at the highway. I'm, I'm certainly not trying to badger you with the questions I got. I'm trying to figure out from an informational standpoint as to what you know. We, we used to train bird dogs, and we had this same problem. And now, where we live, we can't. A hundred acre track is large where I am now. Yes. Where it used to be ten and twelve thousand acre tracks. And I, I realize what your problem is, but how how many times? And anybody can answer this question for me because this, like I said, this is an informational type. How many times are you denied access to your dogs off of other people? I mean, is it a huge problem? Yes, sir. Does it depend? I guess it depends on which, where you are and in, in which club. But, I mean, is it certain areas that you're having more trouble in, or is it is it your fast growth? Because I know Brantley County's got a – I mean, y'all, in Brantley County's beginning to have an invasion of people. Is, is that where your problems are, where your people are moving in, or is your problems where you've been there all along? Well, it's, it's certainly pertaining to the area of the state that, that the club is in. But, uh, and, and like, like I said, we are able to work with most of our neighboring landowners, and we have to, especially since this law came into effect in 2003. We, uh, I personally have went around all, all the landowners around me, but they're – there is one landowner that I can't deal with, and he's he's just a tenant on the the farm. He don't even own the land, but he has uh, permission to look after it. So uh, so he takes a, a offense. And what huh? what our main objective is, Mr. Crawford, is not not that we're losing dogs, but we don't want that 100 acre track of land there that has a dog uh, uh, wander across it three or four times a year. To cost us the whole lease of fourteen thousand acres. Now that costing that, you talking about costing the lease with a landowner. You're not talking about costing your lease with your, uh, with your permitting, are you? Where's right. your it, with 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 the permit of the hunting club? And, and yeah, I realize they can pull it, and that's why I'm asking though: is your, is your problem with your with your landowners that you're leasing from, or is your is your problem? Is your problem you're trying to cure a part, a, a large part of it, your permitting process with the department? Right. Is that what I hear y'all say? It's opening a door for people to get you charged for your dog bill process when it's You talking about charge from a criminal, from a right. civil? Right. It's actually a civil penalty right. in the criminal stuff. And uh, some people, they'll take that and run with it. 
Mr. Chairman, I didn't ask the guard to ask these questions. I'm fine with it. Okay. Stop me if I'm not, if you, if you got a problem. But, I mean, I, let me ask this then. So most of, you ga most of you game and fish ordinances or, I mean, state ordinances are prosecuted by probate court. Are these <coughs> prosecuted by pro pro in the probate court also? Where aren't they, are they prosecuted in probate court? Okay. Uh, it's state, in state court. court. Or state court. And, and federal. And federal, and federal sir. Yeah. yeah, I know about the federal problem. Uh, that's, that's something we can't help you with. I mean, even... Even if we change this, I don't think that's going to help you with a federal problem. Yes, sir. They're, what they're, what they're using this to they're enforce They're using it. this as their law. Exactly. They do not have a federal law that would, uh, that would protect them from the state. But I expect even if we change this, you, we're, I would imagine, I'd bet you 100 to nothing, we're not going to help you in federal court even if we change this. I mean, with federal. Tom, let me say on that, uh, what I understand the judge uh, used is the reason for the ruling over there uh, on the federal magistrate. The federal, the federal, where they had over there on Fort Stewart. He used that law that we, the state, passed. And this is just taking and modifying one little section of that law. I realize, I realize that, but even if we do that, even if, we, if this is passed, signed into law, I'll bet you a hundred and nothing that you're going to have a federally imposed regulation by the local because of the local commanding officer can impose it. Not this. He can impose whatever regulation he wants, and that's what you're going to end up with over there. I may can, but at least we'll be doing our part. Yeah, I understand that. But let me, let me ask one follow-up question. On, the, on your permitting with the department, how many actual permits have you lost? I believe there have been two clubs actually pulled. Do you know how many violations those clubs had against them before those permits? I mean, is there a warning? We don't have the rules and regs. I went and pulled the statute. I don't have the rules and regs in front of me that go that the statute also authorizes, which would be through natural resources. Is there a process of infractions from from one to four, or, or is it at the discretion of the commissioner totally? The law reads that it is the discretion of the commissioner. Uh, I think in those instances, it wasn't so much the number of, of violations as to the the violent extent of the of the, the violation in Do, those cases. Is anybody can tell me to what extent Matt, that is? Bill Go Fletcher. On. Is him with DNR. Oh, I didn't even see him stand. I'm sorry, Bill. I see you now. I mean, yes, am, I, am I getting ahead? Of <laughs> well, I was going to let him talk, but if, if, if uh, depending on whether you want to wait and ask him a question or. Well, I'll do whatever you want to do. I'll be quiet. How about let me get through the list and let Mr. Bill talk? I think you can ask him a question. question. Penny had a question, too. Mr. Gaston. Mr. Gaston, thank you. Appreciate you coming up here, Ronnie. When, if we pass this bill, doesn't it just put deer dogs in the same category as other dogs. It, it would give our deer dogs the same right as a fox dog or a coon dog or a bird dog other, or a rabbit other, dog. Other dogs. And a field trial dog or any other dog. Yes, ma'am. And just simply put, we just want a deer dog treated like other dogs. That's that exactly right. Too. And I, I know from field trial, and we have field trial dogs that run real big too and, and far out, and we just want the deer dog treated like the other one, not discriminated against. Yes, ma'am. That's Thank correct. Ellis, did you, did you have a question? I, I was going in to try to get back to the Okay. Because the problem is, is, is people can't get their permit pulled. Okay. Anybody else have any questions for Mr. Gaston? I sent a consolation to you. I, when I was at ABAC, I spent more time than I should have in Barron County. Uh, so we're glad you came up here. Well, I don't know about that. No, this is on TV. My wife's watching. Uh, Jimmy Henderson.
Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I'm Jimmy Henderson. I'm Vice President of Georgia Hunting and Fishing Federation. And I, too, feel just like a pack of my dogs just went off my property. Gives me the same feeling to be up here this morning, so I'm a little nervous. Um, I've got everything scattered. Hunting with dogs in general, and deer hunting with dogs in particular, is a, is a tradition that's been in our country from the very foundation of it. It's been passed down through from generation to generation. As has already been said, grandparents have carried grandchildren, and parents have carried their children, children hunting. And they've passed on this great sport that we love so much. I, too, my, my parents didn't hunt, but my grandfather carried me from early age fox hunting. Uh, and cat hunting, we, I, I went with him at every opportunity that I could go to the country and be with him and go hunting at an early age. He, he gave me a pair of hound dogs that I was able to take uh, back to the city and raise. And when they got big enough to go and join the chase, I carried them back and uh, had many, many um, Friday and Saturday nights that out there enjoying hearing my hounds run as a young, as a young child. Our founding fathers were also houndsmen. George Washington was a, a great fox hunter and uh, kept a large pack of fox hounds at his Mount Vernon home and continually tried to improve them. I'm sure they deer hunted with dogs too at that time. Uh, although deer season only lasts 11 or 12 weeks, uh, even less in some counties of the state, all year long is, is spent in preparation, getting ready for it. Uh, we're, we're planting, we're planning, we're doing things, getting ready for the hunting season. And when it finally comes in and it goes out, uh, many months are spent afterwards talking about it and telling the tall tales that go along with it. And that's a big part of it. Uh, dog hunting clubs are a little different than steel hunting clubs. First thing has already been mentioned, most of them are larger in size, from 1,000 to 20,000 or more acres. This leads to a larger diversity of activities that can be uh, enjoyed on these clubs. As I've been vice president of the Hunting and Fishing Federation, I've been able to travel around the state and talk to many hunting clubs uh, and enjoy some hunts that um, I would have never got to be on had it not been for this. So some of these clubs not only enjoy dog hunting for deer, uh, but they bear hunt, they coon hunt at night, fox hunt at night, rabbit hunt in the daytime, and uh, a lot of other types of hunting, small game hunting, hunting without dogs. <laughs> a lot of our hunting clubs have ponds and river landings uh, that fishermen enjoy. A lot of most clubs you go to have uh, access for four wheelers and ATVs to ride on. You don't won't be seeing them up and down the highways around these hunting clubs. They have a place they can go. So if we lose the dog hunting clubs or, or if we don't get some help. It's not only the deer dog hunter that's going to lose. It'll be a, a large, diverse uh, segment of the population that'll lose on things to do. Deer hunting with dogs brings a, a great, diverse group of people together. As, as I've been deer hunting for 40 some years, ever since I was about nine years old, it has brought the young people, the very youngest people out there, along with the very oldest. And a lot of these people couldn't enjoy other types of, of hunting sports, but they're out there in the deer woods enjoying it. It also brings black and white together on equal playing field. Uh, there is no difference in people when they're talking about hunting and they're talking about their hunting dogs. Uh, we don't see black, white, young or old. There's no difference. We're just hunters out there enjoying a good sport. The excitement that you see on a young child's face when he's out there hunting is what we really love. I can tell you the day that came when, when you can give a young child a couple of puppies and let them raise them till they're big enough to one day get into chase. It's a prideful thing for a young child, and I, I dearly love to see that. Price of a good dog, I believe about $250. A good shotgun to hunt with, 500 to to 1000 Look on a child's face at that time, you know it's priceless. And that's what we live for, to bring those kids up. Uh, another thing I'd like to say is based on the DNR statistics that we have, I think the deer dog problems have been blown out of proportion to the fact that if we took the numbers that somebody else will come up here and talk about in a minute, and we use them to apply them with the same theory to other 
segments of the hunting world, I think deer dog hunting would still be going on like it always has. I realize there have been some problems. We have worked hard to correct those problems. I started coming up to Atlanta three years ago. And as some of them said they're a mechanic, I'm a machinist, so this is just something completely out of line for me. But when I first started coming up here three years ago, I thought we could get some change. It didn't happen. And we've lost a lot of hunting clubs since. But in, in that process, we have learned. We've talked to the legislatures. I've talked to a lot of y'all. We've talked to the DNR Commission and, and the people that run that. And we found out things that needed to be done. They told us that, that we needed to help clean up the dog hunting problems. We've done that. Through education, going around talking to hunting clubs, weeding out bad people that have, have caused most of these problems. And I'm going to tell you, it's a very small segment of the, of the hunting world that's causing most of these problems. And most of them don't have a place to hunt anymore. Because if I know that somebody's going to continually cause problems on my hunting club, I'm, I'm going to ask him to leave. He's going to have to go. I don't want him to lose, cause me to lose what, what I've been doing all my life. <coughs> We will continue to work with those issues. Uh, we're not only here for this one issue. We're here for the long haul, and I hope that we can, in the future, continue to work with the legislatures up here. I've, I've met a lot of you. Uh, some of you here are from, from my home area. I'm from Bryan County, and, and, um, and that's what we look forward to, coming and working on issues on, in the future on these things that need to be taken care of. There are many types of hounds that we use to hunt with, the walker hound being the prevalent, uh, breed, but there are many others, Julys, Black and Tans, Red Bones. In the town of Sparta, Georgia, it's said to be the birthplace of the July Hound. I've never been there, but they say there's a monument that says birthplace of the July Hound. I dearly hope, and my fervent prayer is, that there's nowhere in the state of Georgia that there's a tombstone put up one day that said death of the deer dog hunting club. And that's my prayer, and I ask you to help support Bill 1424, again, I say we, we continue to work and tr try to improve our sport. I have some letters of support from the United Kennel Club down to uh, local businesses, county commissioners, and different ones that would like to ask also for your support for this bill, and I thank you very much for hearing us today. Yes, sir. Okay. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, for this opportunity to speak to you. I have some things I'd like for you to pass out, please. Uh, when this uh, bill was passed, uh, Section 11 of HP 815, I really believe there was some good intent in this bill. But like any other law, when the word intent is included in it, it gets dangerous. Uh, to start with, it, with, with the admission of DNR, no fault was ever given or any studies ever given on this bill before it was passed. No, no studies of any type. Nothing on how many clubs would be affected that had never caused a problem. Uh, or how many clubs would not be able to hunt again that hadn't caused a problem because of the thousand acres. Instantly, we wiped out, we know of a hundred clubs right off the bat of people did not have a thousand acres to hunt on that had never caused problems. Instead of allowing this law to go into effect and allowing the clubs that are already in existence to get a permit and weed out the problems through that process, we threw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, no one did an economic impact study. And as Ronnie said, we're pretty glad that, that it didn't go public for our wives to see. But uh, it's tremendous impact that this, this, this board has on the economy in the state of Georgia. Another study that wasn't done was the effect it would have on the minority clubs. In my three-county area, it immediately wiped out six clubs. Those six clubs are now hunting in South Carolina. Where did those license sales go? Well, we know, right to South Carolina. Uh, we hear a lot from, from DNR about the license sales going down. 
But we don't hear anything about from DNR on how to improve our license sales. If every time we stuck around, there are more restrictions being placed on the outdoor community. We're not encouraging people to go hunting and fishing. We are discouraging with the restricted restrictions we come out with every year. The liability threat that this has caused is tremendous on the hunting person. Sure, we haven't had but the two permits pulled, and they needed to be pulled. Anytime there's a threat involved in anything, it needs to be addressed. But this, the threat of a hunter leaving his home in the morning to go hunting and coming back home that night facing anything from a $65 fine to a $1,000 fine, with the average being $260, and that's DNR numbers, that's a pretty stiff thing for a man to face. That's, that's, that's a threat. Would you want to leave your house in the morning to enjoy your sport, or could you enjoy your sport that day, thinking all the time that you guys had a $260 fine before you come home that night? Uh, people no longer, we can no longer allow our kids to put their name on a dog collar and brag about that being their dog, because we can't take a chance of him getting a fine. <laughs> That's a little ridiculous thing. <laughs> Okay, we are not trying to gut this law, Section 11.815. We are trying to improve it. That's all we want to do is improve it. We want some help for the legitimate hunter that is hunting on permitted property so he will have protection if his dog gets off that property. These people, and by DNR's own admissions, are doing a great job of handling their dogs. We need to give them some help to show them we appreciate this. Not keep them down under your thumb because this bill will eliminate dog hunting. I used to sell a lot of deer dogs. I raised dogs. I also still hunt, so I know both sides of the fence. Uh, when this bill went into effect, you couldn't give a dog away. As a matter of fact, I would be at the feed store buying dog feed, and they'd be coming up saying, you want some deer dogs? I'm giving them away. We immediately lost a lot of hunters from the threat of this bill. All we want is some help. Now, you want some numbers? I'm going to give you some numbers straight from DNR. 2005, 2006, there were 5,813 hunting citations issued in the state of Georgia. The total citations relating to dog deer hunting, and remember this is 357 permitted clubs, and the total number of citations was 83. That is less than 1.43% of the citations issued statewide. Again, and, and the dog hunter had that amount, 1.43%. The dogs off a of permitted property was 38% of that 83 violations. Only 38% of that 83 total violations was for a dog off a of permitted property. All right, this season affects 41 counties for a period of 12 weeks or 86 days, however you want to look at it. So if you break up that 32 violations into 13 Saturdays, that's 2.46 dogs off a of permitted property a Saturday. Out of about 17,850 dogs, just turned loose in 41 counties on a Saturday. Now, it looks to me like they're doing a pretty good job. There's probably not another sport out there can say they only get two violations a Saturday with all these people that hunt. Now, I couldn't tell you what that 46, .46 dog looks like, but I probably could use him to run that rat that they genetically transferred into a deer over there in DNR and feeding him meat. So, but... And I'd like to ask that fat biologist if that rat grows a rat and if the points have got to be an inch on each side and four of them before he can shoot him. <laughs> but uh, that's all he'd be good for. But if you go on and say you 86 days, that would only be point thirty seven dogs a day off of a property. So you've got to realize these guys are doing a terrific job of keeping a deer on the property. I mean a dog on the property. All right, it looks like the DNR 
or want something from the deer hunter that they're not requiring from the dog hunter that they're not requiring from anyone else. And that's total perfection. And that's impossible. That's why this bill will close them down. It, it's no way, I don't care what size of dog you use, what kind of dog you use, there's no way that you can keep every dog on a piece of property every time. It's eventually going to get off sometimes. All we're asking for is give this man the opportunity to get his dog back without getting a fine. The majority of these dogs that are picked up and charged with violations are on their way home. They're not harming a thing. They're not causing any damage. They, they are on their way back home. Because if he could have been caught when he was left running that deer, he would have never been over there to start with. So they're picking most of these dogs up, and we have documented cases where the dog was picked up on road coming home, not bothering anything. It has made a target of the deer dog. You can see people stop and look at a deer dog, or like at a dog on the road. If he doesn't have that number on his collar, they won't mess with him. But if he's got that number on his collar, they'll pick him up. And we've had him haul as much as 40 miles, and we have that documented. And then a game warden called. No consideration is taken into the fact that there's no way a deer, that dog could have went that far, that quick in a day. So let's see the threats that we, they are under. And we're just asking to give them a break. They are doing a great job. I have heard the comment that, well, what would be the incentive for these people to keep doing a good job if they're not going to get fined? That's plain and simple. This bill has done nothing else, has helped us clean up the hunting community. It has let, made the hunters realize that if we can get some relief now, we have got to keep working hard as we are right now because if this ever comes back on us, it's going to be worse than it is now. And so that's the incentive. We can keep it clean. They will keep it clean. You can bet on it. They will work just as hard as they're doing right now if you just give them a break. Uh, the, the dog deer hunter is the biggest help to WRD in controlling the, do the antlerless deer population. You're still hunter, and you can ask any of them. They are out there for the rack. They could care less about that doe. They want the rack. Another restriction that the dog that has been placed on the dog hunter is the antler restriction. DNR almost makes an outlaw out of a legitimate dog hunter. After he kills one buck that may be small, if he kills his first buck and it's under the, under the, the small size regulation, the next buck he can kill has to have four points on one side and they got to be over an inch long. Now, I would like for you to tell me how you can stand and watch a deer cross from this bank to that, that get counter there with a dog running at 15 to 35 miles an hour, and you tell me how many points he's got on one side and how long they are. So from then on, if he killed that one buck and he shoots another one, unless he's got what we call a rocking chair, he knows he's taking a chance on breaking the law. So he's got to shoot a doe. So therefore, they kill more does. And it's a known fact that th this happens. Deer dog hunting is the safest way to hunt a deer. How many of you know of anyone killed this year deer dog hunting that was shot? But we all know of the still hunting fatalities. Deer dog hunting is your safest way to deer hunt. So I don't know why we want to be putting them under regulations that eliminate it, especially at a time when we have a constitutional amendment coming up to pro protect the tradition of hunting and fishing in the state of Georgia. Why are we trying to eliminate a tradition? We need to be coming on some common ground. Let's work out some ways we can improve this. And let's give the deer dog hunter some help. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I want to applaud each and every one of you for coming up here today. Um, it's amazing. 
Uh, you took your time to come up here to Atlanta. There's other organizations up here that's got high-paid lobbyists. You don't. You take your personal time, and we do appreciate that. I mean, that means a lot for us to see you come up here to, to get involved in this. And I think basically what it comes down to, Mr. Dickey, is we're just trying to help protect the tradition that we want to continue to pass on for generations, and we're trying to to basically not make someone a criminal just because a dog can't tell where the property line is. Yes, sir. And that's what it's all about. And I think that uh, I applaud y'all's efforts for being here today. This is a good bill, and I think we continue to move forward with it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else got any questions? Go ahead, Mac. I think I got a couple like that, but go ahead. Go ahead. Let me just ask you for my own information and maybe some more, too. The, the purpose of uh, Representative Smith's bill is to help with the problem of a dog getting off of the hunting club, right? Yes, sir. But you just said that there wasn't but 2.46 dogs out of 17,850 turned loose last year on a weekend that yes, got sir. off of the property. Yes, sir. Where's the problem? That's what I ain't figured out. All right. <clears throat> the problem is, sir, would you want to go hunting this morning if that might be one of your dogs that got off the property? If you may be so unlucky as to be one of the two owner of one of those violations? That's the problem. It's not that, that uh, it happened every day. That's why we say, why can't we get some relief? It's not like we're getting 100 dogs a day off. Why can't we get some relief where we will not have to go under that threat? I don't want to leave my house in the morning thinking that I may be the unlucky person that day. That's the lottery I don't want to win. I mean, I, you, yes, sir. you're doing a good job. That's what I'm asking where the problem <laughs> well, is. That's is, what I'm saying. Is, why, why, is we ha why are we having a problem getting some relief when we're doing such a great job? Matt, go ahead. Dickie, I, if I understand this situation right, you tell me if I, I mean, don't, don't hesitate to argue with me. I won't. I'm not going to get offended whatsoever, and I'm not trying to. What are you laughing about? And I'm not trying to, to, to entrap you. What I'm trying to do is actually get to the heart of the problem. As I see it, your, your problem, I'm not so sure that, that you that this bill is the right way to address your problem. Now, I think I understand what your problem is. But this, this code section F goes to, when you said it goes to deer dogs, this goes to every dog, not just deer dogs. Yes, sir. There's nowhere it says in this bill or in this code section that it comes under does it address deer dogs. Section 11. All hunting dogs. Section 11, 8, 815. No, sir. I'm talking about statute now. I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about your regulations. I'm talking about statute-wise. This bill does not address deer dogs only. Let me answer that for you. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, you're, you're you're correcting that, Mac. In that um, the only one singled out by regulation is the deer dog hunters. Uh, the rest are not uh, affected one way or the other by the bill because they're not under regulation. Right. So um, there would be no point to restrict this to deer dogs because we don't want them doing the same. We don't want them doing that on fox hunters or coon hunters or anybody else. So while we... While we're eliminating the deer dog hunters, if the bill also makes it where down the line they can't do the same thing to the fox hunters or coon hunters, and so be it. We don't have a, a problem, you know, with that. And let me say, getting back to the chairman's question, uh, it's not. It's just like having a cloud over them all the time. It'd be like us as legislators, something that maybe we know we're not apt to, to do today. But if but if they go, if if we did, if we were going to have a big fine put on us for some little something that we couldn't help, it'd be a, you walk around with that cloud all the time, wondering what's going to happen. And uh, so this bill is not going to have a major uh, practical impact. 
uh, in that there's not that many valleys to start with, but it just removes that cloud that they're having to go under all day, and it, it, it's taking some of the fun out of the hunting because they're thinking, well, I may be the one. And a lot of these hunters are not wealthy people. They're poor folks. And it just takes a cloud away from them, even though that's not likely to happen. It's still that possibility. And that's even though the bill is not going to change a whole lot, it does remove uh, a threat there and make going to make hunting a lot more pleasant for these hunters. Can I follow up on that? Ellis has got a question. Go ahead and let Ellis know. I, I was going to address this to you. I think the process here is regulated. That's and where I'm is, going to. And, and, and the fact <coughs> is, is, is this is a method of getting uh, to what we face so often. And we sit up here and we enact laws and then we empower uh, some regulatory agency to implement uh, regulations to carry this out, and then they take that and go under the law with it. And, 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 and let me add an answer to that. That's, that's exactly right. And we would not be before you today if the department would have agreed to eliminate that regulation on their own. We went to them and asked them to do that, said we will not introduce legislation if you all will change the regulation on your own. They would, they, uh, would, not, do, would not, not agree to do that, and that's, that's why it, it requires legislation to, to get it done. Okay. Mr. Chairman, can I follow up? Yes, go ahead. The, have you all been in front of the Natural Resources Board with this problem? Or did y'all just go to administration? We, we have uh, worked with the commissioner. But y'all have not asked for an appearance before the board? Uh, I haven't asked for one. And uh, I have talked to one or two of the board members, and I felt like that it would be unproductive if we, if we did. We wouldn't, uh, from the response I got was, unless the legislature changed the law, they wasn't going to uh, go in a different direction from what the department uh, leadership wanted to go in. Let me get Jay right quick, and then I'll come back to you. No, I'm all right. Your button is on. Is it? Yeah. But I don't mind speaking, but jump on The reason you're caught in this trap, as I see it, you're the only one that uses hunting dogs that a permit is required. Yes, sir. If you didn't have to have the permit, you wouldn't have to have any legislation concerning the dogs and the trespass. That's right. Now, let me ask, you already <coughs> asked Wayne a question, to the council. It, it's 2716, isn't that trespass code? Yes, it's criminal trespass. That's what I thought. It does. I mean, I said, I said it backwards, 7672 or whatever. It's criminal trespass. Yeah, that's a general trespass code. I don't, I'm not so sure that I would be willing to include that section in the Dog Roaming Act. Now, let me tell you why I say that. When you get into metro areas, that is the only provision you have. And I know you, you're looking at it from a hunting dog standpoint. I'm looking at it from a technically a nuisance standpoint. That is the only code section that you have to enforce roaming dogs on property with cattle or anything else is your trespass statute. Now, I, I think it, and, and Wayne, this is an aim that you're drafting, that that takes it one step too far because you're going to have to, there's no way to treat your dog that's on my property any different than your dog on my property killing my goats if I'm in the, if I'm in, the uh, in, a, in an area different from where you are I don't know how else there would be to enforce that, tres that trespass and damage. Now, if there's a way I'm missing something, May I respond, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, yes, sir. Tell me. What this says is that this does not, by giving the hunters this immunity, so to speak, does not affect 
the trespass law. If they're still guilty on the trespass law. Oh, I see you put in there nothing in this subsection of that. That's correct. Well, why, why would we put that in there to be anyway? Does it need to be in there? Or could we just strike it and it still have the same effect? It's for clarity's purposes. Just for clarification. Well, we limited it to your own. Do you care? Well, well, if you do that, then let me ask you then also, right. Wayne. If we done away with the permit, then the problem wouldn't be a problem. It wouldn't be a problem. And, but also, if you're doing that, then you're saying that this subsection shall not affect the in, the provisions about uh, misdemeanors, felonies, and and uh, and uh, fines under the wildlife. I mean, under game and fish. Twenty-seven three one. Twenty-seven three one is hunting the land and other without permission. Yeah. That's right. That's okay. So you. That, that is yeah. in here. That excludes uh, enforcement of the final land and other right. permission to make clear that he's going to deal with the dog going across. Sounds great. If the hunter goes across and hunts right. somebody that's 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 property, right. you still prosecute right. them under 2731. All right. How are you going to do that under your hunting with dog, under, under 27316? that affects all dogs. Wayne, I know I'm hard-headed and I'm missing a point somewhere, some here. I'm not sure if all your questions. I'm not sure. It, it does apply to all dogs, and the two exceptions say, to make clear that Trespass. It only applies to the dog going across. Uh, not to the person not going. Not to the person. Not, not to the person going across, okay. So the fines and all only go to the dog and not the person. That's correct. If, if you go at, on this graph, if you go after the dog without permission to join landowner, then you're then you're still liable. Yes, that's correct. That's right. That's correct. Under both trespass and under hunting the requirements of hunting without permission, even if you're not hunting and just retrieving the dog. Yes. Sir. Under this bill. Under the substitute. Yes. Uh, with a substitute. That's right. So you think this takes care of problem? It does address the problem. Is it the best way to address the problem? Or does the problem need to be addressed through rules and regs? I think the best way for me to answer that, that's a policy question. Okay. We don't direct the thing on the rest of it. One thing I'd like to say is, is remember that when we start letting out, when we start regulating our hunting community on a complaint-related basis, all hunting is in danger. The anti-hunters love it. They are tickled to death to see this on TV. It's right up there at it. It's giving them ammunition every second. And don't you think when they find out that it can't be regulated on a complaint basis, that it's going to get any better. They will come down on hard on every phase we, of hunting and fishing we do. So let's keep that in mind when we start regulating our hunting and fishing on a complaint-related basis. Mr. Ellis, did you have a question? No, I was. It's butt, butt work. I'm asking butt work. Oh, okay. Okay. All right, does anybody else have any questions for Mr. D? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Billy Kirk. All, all of y'all is just talking, we may call you back up if somebody's got a question, if you don't mind. Go ahead, Mr. Bill. Uh, my name is Billy Kirk. I'm from Liberty County. Uh, appreciate y'all's time and uh, hope y'all support this bill. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, sir. I ain't but two more. I just don't want them to ride all the way up here and fight this cotton picking traffic and not get a chance to say something. Uh, oh, Jake, I was trying to put an L on that. Jake Hoyt. Thank you for your time. My name's Jake Horton. I'm from uh, Liberty County, uh, supporting New Ground Hunting Club and Liberty Hunting Club in Fleming, Georgia. Thank you. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, Kenny Shockley. First of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for taking the time to hear our comments about this House Bill 1424. I am uh, from Jenkins County, and I am president of the Georgia Dog Hunters Association. Um, three years ago, we were instrumental in getting this House Bill 815 passed, and, and I want to speak a little bit about the intent of the bill and, and what this bill will do toward that original intent. Uh, I'll be as brief as possible, but I felt like that probably some of you might not know the history of where we got to where we are today. Uh, three years ago, we had uh, quite a few problems dog hunting wise. We had some rogue dog hunters who were turning loose on other people's land, and, and there was a lot of clubs. I say a lot of clubs, still a, a real majority of the clubs didn't respect property rights of adjacent landowners. And, and uh, they would turn loose big packs of dogs near the property line and wouldn't make a very good effort to try to retrieve them at the end of the day. And, and, and some landowners did have some legitimate complaints. So this House Bill 815, the intent of this legislation was to help solve that problem. And it was, it was uh, intended to give DNR the authority to issue and revoke a permit and to use that authority and that power to regulate dog hunting and to pull a permit from a club who wouldn't conform, uh, didn't try to uh, behave themselves, as opposed to the old system where they would take a telephone survey and pull uh, the dog hunting rights from an entire county. It was a kind of a selective elimination of problem areas as opposed to a county-wide elimination of a, of a problem with deer hunting with dogs. So there was never any discussion about giving citations to individuals. It, the intent was peer pressure from the club on its members to police itself. In other words, if, if, if uh, a club had one individual who didn't conform to the spirit of the uh, permit system and who was an outlaw, then that club could, could, take a, could kick him out of the club and no other club would take him in because they know that would jeopardize their, their permit uh, ability. So that, that was the intent. And we're, we're pleased, the Georgia Dog Hunters are pleased with the overall results of that House Bill 815. We've cleaned up the rogue clubs. We've cleaned up the, the rogue hunter who didn't even belong to a club. Uh, it, it's eliminated uh, hunters trying to hunt on 100 acres knowing that, you know, the dog's not going to be on that property more than five minutes and be on some adjacent property that didn't have permission. So the overall results we're pleased with. What we're displeased with is this ability of the DNR rangers to write warnings and or citations. And, and the first year, it seems like it was pretty much, well, they're going to give warnings, and that, that was fine to the individuals. The second year, it, it was kind of an unwritten policy that you would get a warning on the first offense and a citation on the second, and that was going a little bit further. But this, this third year, there was numerous times where rangers used uh, the first offense as a reason to write a citation, and we felt like that was just really going way beyond the intent of the legislation originally. And we, f we feel like that through regulation or through legislation, we need to address that concern of the legitimate hunter who's doing all he can do to control his dogs, who's living within the spirit of this permit system, and then he's getting, you know, penalized either through a warning or a citation. He, I feel like that the hunter's doing his very best to control his dogs, that a warning or a citation is not going to be a deterrent because he's already doing the best, and I feel like he needs a reward for doing that, and, and, it, and, and the reward would be don't give him a warning or a citation. But, but have the DNR document the number of times these dogs enter this property where the, that's unpermitted and use that as a basis whether or not to apply pressure on the club to police their individuals. Uh, hunters have done a tremendous job, uh, what we call breeding down, going from uh, 
Of course, uh, they still got clubs. It's got 20,000 acres. You can run walkers in Julys, but more people are running black and tans and red bones and slower type dogs, beagles, half beagles and half big hounds. Uh, and then it's like the George Jones song, high tech redneck. Everybody's gone to uh, better communications links to keep up with their dogs, uh, tracking collars, shocking collars. So I feel like the hunting community, the dog hunting community on the whole has done a superb job and I, and I feel like the legitimate ethical hunter who adheres to the spirit of the permit system doesn't need to have a citation hanging over his head, a warning, and be stigmatized as a game violator when he's doing the best that he can do. The only thing we don't want to open up the ability of a rogue hunter to turn his dogs loose on land that's not permitted. And, and, and if the committee thinks it's necessary, you could maybe put a clause uh, that, you know, so long as the dogs are released on property, they have permission, which would, uh, which would uh, apply to uh, coon dogs, fox dogs, that sort of thing, or permitted land, which would apply to deer dog. In other words, we don't want to open up the possibility of letting the rogue hunters have have a legitimate chance to to be rogue hunters again. That that's the only thing that, if if the committee sees fit, that I would say the bill might need is a provision, a, a clause, uh, you know, uh, specifying that the dogs were started out on property where they have permission, and that they uh, then if they wandered off the property, use that as a basis on deer hunting to uh, to uh, document it and then possibly give the club a warning if it's, if it's habitual or uh, in, in nature. Any questions? Thanks, sir. Thank you. I promise you we're listening to you. We're just trying to figure out this, I, I this thing. Thank you for your time. Bill Fletcher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm Bill Fletcher with the Georgia Department of Natural Resources, Wildlife Resources Division. I'm the chief of the game management section. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say is the department fully supports dog deer hunting and is working diligently to ensure it continues to be a viable form of rec recreational hunting activity. Also, I'd like to commend this group for taking their time to come up here and be part of this process, be engaged, and I really appreciate their passion they have for their sport. Prior to passage of the dog deer hunting uh, permit system, conflicts between landowners and dog deer hunting had escalated to the point that we were in danger of losing dog deer hunting altogether. The new law prevented that from happening. After three years under the new system, Complaints from landowners have significantly decreased, and there's no longer the demand from landowners to do away with dog deer hunting. Uh, one benefit that the new law has that maybe many people aren't aware of is uh, this past year a major timber company had, uh, proposed, or had planned on pulling all their lands for dog deer hunting, allowing still hunting only. Uh, our director met with uh, representatives from that timber company and convince them to not do that and the reason that we were able to do that is because of the new law they were the timber company was getting in the past had gotten a lot of complaints from adjoining landowners related to dog deer hunting we gave them the facts and the figures on how the new bill had decreased that and how things were much better and they were willing to uh, take a chance and continue allowing those dog deer hunting leases on their property. Uh, House Bill 1424 will take away the department's ability to surgically remove dog deer hunting clubs uh, that do not respect landowner rights. Although you've heard here how the current law has the authority to revoke dog deer hunting permits based on dogs getting off a of permitted property. The fact is there has never been a permit revoked due to that cause. There have only been two permits revoked in three years since the passage of this law. 
Those were both due to threats of personal violence or threats to uh, personal property. I think as they meant, some mentioned here, you know, those were, were deserved to be pulled. Uh, passage of House Bill 1424 will, loo will leave only one method for the department to deal with chronic problems from dog deer hunting, uh, and that would be through board regulation to restrict seasons, to close portions of counties or all of counties to dog deer hunting. That's something that we don't want to happen. We'd like, we want to continue to see dog deer hunting be viable. I uh, heard quite a few figures thrown out here today. I have some uh, summary of some of those statistics from the past three seasons, and I'll be glad to provide that to the, to the members. Uh, one comment from, uh, I think it was the first speaker, supported, hey, have got, pardon. Have you, have you got a copy? That? I do have a copy, yes, sir. A copy or? Well, I only have uh, one extra with me. Okay. Well, that's all right. That's all right. I'll be glad to provide as many as you need, though. Uh, there was a comment about uh, support of this bill so that uh, an individual could track a wounded deer. There's nothing in the law currently to prevent someone from doing that now if they have permission of the landowner. So this uh, passage of this bill would not enhance that in any way. Uh, Mr. Dickey commented on how well the dog deer hunting clubs were doing, how few violations there were, and he's absolutely correct. There's been uh, tremendous compliance with the dog deer hunting clubs, uh, and there's, there's been fewer violations, much fewer violations the second year of the program than we had the first. Uh, there were an increase in the number of citations issued this year over last year, and there is an explanation for that. Uh, Mr. Shockley stated that, that our rangers were not giving warnings anymore, that we were uh, just giving citations without any warnings. And that, I went back and reviewed our records. That's not, not accurate. Uh, the, main increase in citations was due to uh, what we would call rogue hunters. Those are uh, dog deer hunters that were not permitted, that were turning their dogs loose on unpermitted properties. And those we do not usually give uh, warnings to. If they're unpermitted and releasing on unpermitted property, they're, they're very likely to get a citation without a warning. Uh, when you subtract those from the total number of citations issued, the number of citations this year and last year are almost identical. I went back and looked at, at uh, individual circumstances for the citations in, issued, and the majority of those uh, people that had been received citations had received e either verbal warnings or written warnings prior to getting a citation. So our, our standards for writing citations have not changed. We're still giving verbal warnings and written citations for first offenses. Be glad to answer any, any questions you might have. Okay, hang on just a second. Let me let okay. me get does anybody have any questions for Mr. Fletcher, Matt? Mr. Fletcher, if you uh, if this bill passed as presented, if there is a problem with a club as far as not controlling their dogs, I mean a, a nuisance that arises to the part to the uh, to the level of a nuisance. How would you would you have any way to control that club if this was not in place? I don't believe we would because there would be no violation related related to the permit, and therefore we would have nothing to go on to revoke the permit. Do you have your rules and regs with you? Uh, I believe I do, yes, sir. I, I'm all for trying to find some middle ground if there is any middle ground here. I don't want, to, I don't want the department to have absolutely no control if there is an absolute, and I don't think these people do. I, if there's an absolute abuse and you can't control it by, your, and 
Y'all are the ones that care. You've got the same problem everybody has. A few cause a problem for everybody. And if there is a severe problem, how would you control it if you didn't have this, if, if you passed this statute? I don't think we would be able to control it. Uh, and that's our concern here is we would not have any control. And I believe we would go back to a situation similar that we had prior to the passage of the dog deer hunting permit system and that you would uh, see problems escalate again between landowners and dog deer hunting clubs. Landowners coming to the Board of Natural Resources and asking the board to close counties to dog deer hunting or to close season. And that's certainly not the intent that these people want or we want or anybody. Right, wants. I realize that. And we don't want to see that happen either. Do you have any type of solution to this problem? Uh, no, sir, I don't. I think that the current system is, is working. Uh, the dog deer hunting clubs are doing a real good job. I don't think that uh, we are unduly enforcing the uh, current law, and I think that it's working fine like it is. Okay. Let me ask you, what, what is the problem that you really have with what they're asking to do? I thought I explained that, but the, the, the problem is the current law is, is really tied to keeping dogs on permitted property. If the dogs leave the permitted property and there are continual complaints related to that, then there is a method for us to be able to enforce that. Without there being a penalty for the dogs leaving the property, then the, the law has no real effect. The permit system has has no power. But a dog cannot tell where the property line is. That's correct. So you're meaning to say that we're going to punish someone because that dog does not know where to stop. If you look through the records, you'll see that, that it's, it's not just because a dog crosses, any time a dog crosses a line that there's a citation issued. There's a lot of uh, give and take there. It depends on the adjacent landowner. If the adjacent landowner doesn't have a problem, then we don't have a problem. It's, it's where you have a landowner that does have a problem and there's a continual uh, trespass by the dog onto, onto that unpermitted property where the conflicts come in. But, but, but you're not specifying in your regulations continual. In other words, if it happens one time, Okay, well, here, here's the option. If we pass a regulation that says, okay, uh, you know, there will be no citation written for the first three times, and then after four times, we're going to pull your permit. I'm not sure that this group really wants that because that gives the department no flexibility in when they revoke the permit. We look at all those circumstances, all the violations, all the complaints, when we're making a decision on whether or not to revoke a permit. And as I said from our history, we've only revoked two and they were, were for severe causes. We've written some uh, warning letters for uh, clubs that had what we thought was a significant number of infractions and those all uh, cleared up the next year and did not have any problems after that. So it's worked very well the way it is. And I don't believe there's there's one individual in this room here today that don't want people that's, that's out there that's maliciously violating the law to not be prosecuted. I, I agree with you 100%. I think they all, and, and everybody wants that. What they're trying to say is, you know, let's be reasonable. That's all they're asking. Right. And we feel we have been reasonable in, in working with the clubs, talking to them when there have been problems and uh, trying to get those resolved. I, I'm, fine. I'm done, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ellis. Okay. Yeah, I got you, Daniel. Uh, let, let me go back. I was, you're talking about a problem that doesn't exist because this law right here that we're looking at 
says that the person has, go, got, has got to go get the permission of the owner of the lease to go on the property. Now, that, it, that's, that, alre that is already the case. That's what's, that's what's that's, still in there. Right. Now, now, if that person that owns the property or has the lease objects, then that person still, this does not give them the right to go in there. That's correct. Then uh, what's, what's been happening is these people ain't got guts enough to stand up there to the man's face and tell him they object. They turn around and file a complaint against him and bring y'all in to write up a dead gum ticket. Amen. Amen. I mean, that's the whole problem right there. That may be the case. That's true. I hope. <laughs> Preach on, brother. Preach on. Dr. G. Bill. Yes, sir. When the DNR, I believe I heard you say a while ago that the citation mainly was on uh, road hunting and so forth, it weren't permitting. On line 10 here, if we went in here where it says a mere roaming or escape or pursuit of trailing a game by any dog, if we put after any dog right permitted dog, wouldn't that help a whole lot? Your citations in would be against a dog that was permitted rather than one that wasn't permitted? Uh, would you say that one more? I wasn't able that, to follow uh, you. It seemed like if the dogs, they have to have the permits, and we are trying to give some relief here to the hunters on these violations of permitted dogs. And uh, we don't have the word with, you know, I'm not an attorney. I keep hearing Max talk about the different stuff and, and uh, getting it down legal here in Wayne. And I just wondered if maybe we need to add the word permitted after the uh, word dog there on line 10 and make it permitted dogs. Uh, one thing, we don't write a ticket just based or, a, uh, or give warnings based on a complaint that's called in. Uh, we get quite a few complaints that are unfounded. We investigate each complaint to see if it's valid or not. And if we don't have direct evidence that our rangers encounter, there, there is no action taken. It's, it's classified as an unfounded complaint. You got a situation where, where a man's dog goes over on a neighbor's track of land. He goes to his neighbor and he asks permission to go in there and retrieve him. Now, what problem have you got with that? We, we don't have a problem with that. That's all this bill allows then. Then you don't have a problem with this bill. Uh, I don't. There's more to it than that. Well, can I say one more? Go ahead, Mr. The bill, all I'm seeing here is that we are giving relief to the hunter uh, for violating or letting the dog get on somebody else's uh, property, like uh, Representative Ellis says. And uh, if we pass this bill, then if they have a dog that gets on an unpermitted piece of property, then uh, the ranger's not going to be able to give him a ticket uh, for the dog being out there. And then he can work out the deal of going and getting him from the property owner. So I think that, you know. That's correct. But then if they, if they do that over and over again, then there is still nothing that we can do about it, and then that landowner or landowners are going to get very frustrated that we aren't able to address their concerns, and you'll see them going to our Board of Natural Resources and, and uh, requesting that those seasons be closed in their county. Well, habitual violators is something we can't have. Lynn Moore. Pardon? I'm, I'm saying Some people are just going to be... I bet you're doing it over and over and over, and I don't see how this bill is going to be addressing that anyway. I don't. Mr. Chairman, Representative Black has, has just about asked a question that I really want to ask, but let me ask a couple of maybe insignificant ones. All the citations that you issue, are they come from complaints, or is it that your rangers see dogs and pick them up? There, there, are, some, there are some of both. Some are from uh, where our rangers encounter. Uh, hunters that are that are violating particular statutes, and some are uh, based on complaints that are called in, and that's true of all hunting and fishing violations. There's some of both that that uh, occurs with. But isn't it unfair for the department, though, to pick up a dog that has been no complaint? The dog is on his way home, as I've heard so many of these distinguished people say out here. But yet, the dog is picked up, and a citation is issued. Isn't that unfair to the hunters? 
It, it depends on the circumstances. Uh, I don't believe that happens very often. When it has, I believe that it's been because it, it's been a repeated occurrence. But as a department that is a part of the state of Georgia, we should make sure that our hands are clean first before we go out to penalize anyone else. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So really, you're saying that this bill here would take away your effect of actually going out and giving citations when a part of these citations you had readily admit that is not the fault of these people, right? I got to follow up that question. Okay. Do you keep up with the infractions by club? Yes, sir, we do. Can you provide us with a copy of them? Uh, yes, sir, I can. Have you got it with you? I do not have that with me. No, how, many, how many infractions would a, are your most egregious infractions? You got any idea? Uh, I don't know that off the top of my head. It's, uh, it, uh, you know, as we've already said, it's very, very few clubs have, have many problems. There have been uh, none to warrant revocation this year. There are only three clubs that we are reviewing right now that have had repeated problems that we are reviewing to see if we need to write them a uh, letter kind of putting them on notice that they've had uh, What's your criteria problems. for writing them a letter? That's what I'm asking. Uh, th there is not any specific criteria as far as number uh, of citations or warnings, we look at that objectively to in the uh, totality of the circumstances based on past experiences and and what's happened the previous I mean and what's happened the past season and words, as I said there's no there's no set number that we're looking for we're looking at it uh, repetition of, you know, continuous problems or repeat, repeat offenses. So you don't really have any criteria except discretionary criteria on revoking a permit? That's correct. Where else except in a... Who has that final discretionary... That, that is the authority of the commissioner. Thank you. Jay? So you're, what you're basically telling me is if we pass this bill, then we're taking all your authority away. You're taking away our ability to uh, deal with clubs that, that have repeat offenses related to allowing dogs to get off of permitted property. So if that's the case and we pass then this then we also just need to look at it doing away with Section C that has to do with permits. I'm talking about in the code. Uh, which, uh, which code are you talking about? 27-3-17. Okay, well, the, the uh, I believe House Bill 1424 is dealing with Code Section 27-3-16, not it 17. It is. It is, but what you're telling me, what I'm looking at, if you're telling me that it's not going, we can, we can also go in and amend the bill to, to do away with Section C. Yes, sir. You case. you could do that. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Bill. Okay. Bob Lane. Mr. Jim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to come and uh, stand before you, and I appreciate uh, all these gentlemen here that have come and sacrificed their time to come up and stand up for something they believe in. And uh, I want to uh, make sure that they know, and I, some of them have alluded to it, I think, already, that both the department, both the legislature, both them, the landowners, 
and all the folks that are involved that we talked about this morning are on the same team, on the same side. And that's one thing we got to, to understand to start with. I've, I've stressed that point to some of the landowner groups, uh, and I think that's what, hit, what has hit home with them, that they know that we need to work together, and I think they're doing a better job of working together just as these men have done. They have, I can't say enough for what uh, the, the Georgia deer dog hunters have done to clean up their act. They have, uh, they've done all the things that they have professed they have done. They've gone to, to running, shorter running dogs. They've uh, made a concerted effort to keep dogs off other people's property. They're pretty much policing their own uh, hunting, uh, the folks that hunt like them, the, the rogue hunters. Uh, I've heard of, for instance, where they, you know, have actually turned in people that wasn't obeying the law and were getting, were getting on other people's property, turning down on small tracks and causing problems for them. And I want to say right off that I know that it can't be as enjoyable as it was before we had this law. And, and I regret that. But I want somebody to come up, and I've, I've challenged these folks, and I've challenged the landowners, I've challenged other legislators. If somebody can come up with a better method to do it, I want to hear it. And I'll listen to it, and, and if it comes to my committee, we'll turn to we'll pass it, if it's a better way. Uh, I don't know a better way. And I have yet heard somebody come up with a better way. But today we're hearing basically one side of the story. There's another side of the story. There are people that neighbors of yours and yours and every one of y'all's that have had dogs running on their property that they don't want on there. Some of them are bow hunters. Some of them are steel hunters. Some of them, I had a lady in Scribble County that only she, all she did was rode horses. But she had friends and neighbors of hers that came on her property on Saturdays to ride horses. And they couldn't enjoy it for dogs riding, running all up and un, under them. So you're not hearing from both sides of it. And you all got the, I mean, it's our responsibility as legislators, if we're going to pass a law, to have something that works for everybody. They got rights too. They got personal property rights. If they don't want somebody on the land, they don't need to be on their land. I mean, it's plain and simple. If you own a piece of property or either, any of y'all, and you don't want somebody on it, you got a right to, keep, to preserve that property for your own and use it in your best use and the way you want to use it. And true, they have done everything they can to keep from trespassing. I mean, y'all have done a great job. I mean, I'm not saying you hadn't. You have. And, uh, and we've come a long way. We've come a long way. The landowner groups, I don't even hear anything out of them now. I hardly hear, them, hear from them. They are completely satisfied. And I asked one of them, I, uh, one of the worst, and if I called his name, you'd know who I was talking about. But I asked him after the first year, how, how was it? And he said, well, I'm not going to tell you I didn't have to, you know, they, they were dogs got on my property two or three times. But I called the club. We got a relationship going. They came and got their dogs. They were gone, and everything worked fine. And he said, he said, I know they can't keep them on there all the time. He said, but I remember what you told me about us being on the same side and we need to work together. And uh, it has worked. This law is working. I mean, we spent a lot of time in this. So this thing, I, and basically what I wanted to come up here and give you all a background on it. To be honest with you, we, ain't, we didn't just start on this law three years ago when we passed it. We have met David Waller right there and myself, have met with clubs down in my area, uh, have met several times to talk about what we could do because it was becoming a problem. There were more and more complaints. People were steadily calling in saying, y'all got to do something about the deer dog hunters. They're all over our property. And at that time, and y'all had admit it, they were, uh, they were trucks and people, and it wasn't only just dogs, it was more than dogs. It was trespassing. And they pretty much, some of them felt like they had free reign wherever they wanted to go because that's where they'd done it. And it is, a, it is a long-standing tradition. And it is one of our most important hunting groups that we got. They are valuable. They do kill more uh, doe deer than any other probably uh, segment of hunters. Uh, and that's important to us because, you know, the deer car collision, uh, uh, for one thing. <coughs> The other thing is population control. But they are one of our best game managers. So they have got a place, and we want to keep them hunting. And we don't want them to go out there and have to have a cloud over their head when they're hunting. And I don't have an answer to it. I'm going to tell you right here and right now, I don't have an answer to it. I don't know what to do. But we've done the best we can. And, uh, you know, bless their heart too. They, they know they got a problem, and they've cleaned up the problem, and know we still got a problem. And, you know, it's, we've had it three years. In three years, Reggie, you, you, y'all have come back three years and had three different things. Uh, you know, the first year you wanted to take the numbers off the dogs, off the dogs' collars and off the trucks and, 
You want to reduce the acre size down to 250 acres back? Well, that put us right back where we were. That what you know that wasn't going to work. And uh, I mean, it pretty much repealed it. The next year, you had the nuisance law, and which said, you know, if we hunting, somebody moves in next to us, and and uh, you know, we were here before they were. They're not a thing they can say. Just like your uh, hog herds. Just like right now, if you got a hog pile and somebody moves in next to it, they can't complain about the smell of it because you were there first. Pretty much the same thing, which would repeal our law basically. This repeals our law. This. Guts what we've passed already. The, all the work we've done to get us to this point, this legislation right here would repeal it. There's no enforcement. You just heard Bill Fletcher say there's no way they can enforce it. Now, if y'all can figure out a way to do it, let's do it. I mean, I, I'm open up for. I, I'm open for in, any comments, any opinions you got about how we're going to do it. And it really wasn't a problem. I think the department did well the first couple of years. They knew it was going to be something. They knew it's a volatile issue and that, that we were going to have to work into it. And they couldn't keep dogs on the property. And we still know you can't keep dogs on your property. That's the reason we didn't say, all right, three times, you dogs get off your property, we're going to take your permit. Y'all know that couldn't happen. We know that. And we know you still going to have dogs that get off your property. And, and we know we got to live. The landowners know they got to live with that. But they do. But, but prior to passing this, I want to tell y'all, man, the people next door to these people had nothing they could do. Not one thing. The only thing that could happen is you could have a county, the, the, the board. The board had complete control and still do, primarily. The board could cut that season in half, or they could cut it in thirds, or they could give them two weekends, or four weekends, or eight weekends, or whatever. And that, or either they could eliminate it in that county. Uh, I mean, it's something along those lines. But the land, and that you had to have enough complaints. Somebody's going to have to get killed or something before it happens, and that's what's going to happen here. We repeal this law. Somebody's going to get killed over it because somebody's going to shoot somebody's dog. He's going to find out about it, and he's going to take it up with the guy that did the shooting. And he might not get killed, but they're going to get hurt bad. And if y'all don't do something, if you don't keep this law in place, you know, I, I don't want to say it's going to be hanging over y'all's head, but somebody's got to be responsible for it. Now, I don't know... Uh, I mean, I appreciate Representative Smith and Reggie and, and, and every one of you, Jimmy, all y'all that, that, that have come up with something. Uh, you know, some try, trying to come up with something, but I'm telling you, we ain't got there yet. This isn't it. This bill right here will not do the job. And uh, they got a different kind of uh, penny. I mean, their dogs are different than not your field trial dogs. I mean, they, you know, they... It's just a different situation, and uh, it's a different kind of dog, a different sport, and you can't compare it with it. And to be honest with you, we're not having a lot of trouble with any other kind of dog. We're not having trouble with rabbit hunters or bird hunters or squirrel hunters or coon hunters or uh, even hog hunters. We're not having trouble with any of those dogs, and we don't want any trouble with it. And we don't want to bring that. We don't want to tie them into the rest of it, of it because we, we all hunters, and we want everybody to have a good time. We want these folks to have a good time. And, uh, you know, like I said, if I had the answer, I'd tell you, tell you right now, I don't have it. We did the best we could with what we got. It's a complete program. And it basically just says you, if you hunt a, if you got a dog and you're going to hunt him he, with a hunting club, you need to have a number of the club. on. You'll be issued a permit if you've got 1,000 acres. Now, we have, been, we have tweaked this bill because when we first did this, here's, I'm going to tell you how, and I'll tell you how we tweaked it. We said you had to have a, a number on the collar. And if a, a vehicle was involved in the hunt, he had to have a number on. That's if I'm a if I'm a landowner and there's somebody up the hill there at park and I don't know who it is, or, or uh, you know it might be one of the rogue hunters we talked about. We don't know, but if I go up there and I see a number on it, I know what club it is. Just getting his tag number won't help you. I can tell you right now, because you'll get Joe Blow out of the Cab County is who tag it belongs to. You don't know what club he's with. You don't know if he's a rogue hunter. You don't know if he was a member of a club or what. So the so this the system we got is a complete. It's not a uh, it ain't it didn't take a rocket scientist to come up with it. In fact, the Georgia Dog Hunters Association is one that brought it to us because we had been meeting with them three years prior to this. We met with them and said something had to happen. It came to a head a little quicker than I thought it would, but it's nothing we did. But uh, some of the members here were in the board meeting, and I'm telling you at that time, and I don't know if it's changed or not because we had to have some changes, but they wasn't a board member over there that was supportive of dog hunting because of all the complaints they were having. <coughs> we were having property burned. We were having fences run over. We were having trespassing was a regular thing. A lot of complaints were coming in. All that is pretty much calmed down now. 
And like Eugene Tillman said one time, we were taking up a, a, a cast netting bill. He said, we got peace now. We at peace. You know, these people ain't toting guns and knives to these public hearings we got. And, uh, you know, we pretty much at peace now between the landowners and dog hunters. And, and it's unfortunate that, that you, we can't pass something that's going to be just like, to be perfect. I, I mean, I don't know what uh, any other way to put it, but be perfect. Cause that, that's what it'd have to be. But I'm open, have been, and I will be. The changes we made, I'm getting back to, I'm rambling a little bit, but we did make some changes. When we passed the bill, we had some folks that said, you know, it ain't right. I got 600 acres of land, and I can't deer hunt with dogs on it. Been living all my life. Had some people in Effingham County, the minorities you were talking about. So we got 260 acres of land or something. I don't remember how much it was. We can't hunt anymore. Well, we came back, and we changed that. Y'all changed it. You said if you got 250 acres and you own the land, then you can get a permit to hunt it, and you can hunt it. Now, that was we bent that law, and it's working fine. I think, Kenny, you told me that, that we had a fairly large number of people that took advantage of it in the complaint level. If it's moved any, it's moved very little. Uh, so, we, so that part's working for us some. And it allowed those people, the minorities and the others, the small landowners, to, to enjoy the sport just like everybody else. There's still a lot that can be done, and I don't want to sit here and it might be stupid, to be honest with you, but I've worked with dogs all my life. I've trained dogs. My dogs will come to me when I call them, but I work with them. I put a shock collar on them, and if they don't come, I bump them with that shock collar. And it's humane, and it's not inhumane. It's just like a little, just like a little uh, pinch or something, you know. And uh, yeah, well, you can turn it up and get a fee. You can turn it high as you want to if you are inhumane. Let I me mean, laugh about it. It's a tool. It's the best tool they've ever they've had to come out with. I guess since the peanut inverter and or, or sliced bread, whatever y'all want to say. But anyhow, it's a good tool that you can use and you can train dogs. I don't know about these dogs. They might get out of range and, and through, uh, through woods and all that. But if you, uh, I think if you made an effort, what I'm saying is there's probably other things that you can do. I don't know that. I'm not proposing that. Uh, and I'm not saying that, you know, your dogs get off the property. Uh, you know, I, to be quite honest with you, the fines I've heard, and I don't know what they are, I heard $250, and I think that's a little steep. But we don't get the money. The state doesn't get the money. The DNR doesn't get the money. We don't get the money as legislators. I don't care what the fine is. But you've got to have something. If you don't have, if you don't have some, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? If you don't have some depth to deter it, you know what, the, who, you know, if you ain't got something out there, they ain't even going to make an effort to, put, to keep the dogs on the club. Now they are making an effort, but I'm afraid that it, it might get to that point. I, I think they realize now, though, that the, that, that the landowners that join them need some respect and deserve respect. And, uh, you know, y'all heard of the silent majority. Well, that's what it is. It's a silent majority out there. You know, the, the hunters, all our hunters aren't 4% of the population. So anyhow, I, I've, I'm... Uh, I don't know if there's some other things I was going to mention. I learned a lot today, though. I didn't know that Sparta was the home of the July, was the home of the July uh, uh, hound dog. So I've learned some things here today. But uh, like I say, with this bill that we got, the landowners do have some recourse. It is very little. The most they can do is to call up and issue a complaint. And we wrote in the law. Not only did we say you got to have the numbers on the dolls, the numbers on the trucks, and you had to have a thousand acres or either two fifty on it, but we said a complaint had to be verified by a law enforcement officer. Somebody couldn't call up and say, you know, Joe Blow's got dolls running on my property again. This is the third time this week or whatever. That doesn't amount to a hill of beans. It doesn't even the department doesn't even. They, they, they do register as an unfounded complaint, but it doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything as far as that permit goes. And I tell you, with the number of clubs we've got, as <coughs> long as we've been running it, two permits being revoked is not a bad record. And, I mean, they deserve a lot of credit for that because they worked hard to do it. And I wish that we could. I mean, maybe we should put a maximum fine on it or something, something they could live with. I mean, I don't know if that's a... Uh, I mean, I'm willing to work with them, do whatever it takes. Uh, but I think there needs to be some deterrent there because if you don't have something with some teeth in it, you're not going to have anything. And you all know that. You do it every day. You make laws every day. With that, I'm going to quit, and uh, I'll answer any questions anybody might have. Dr. Gene. Uh, Bob, you're a big quail hunter, and I've hunted quail for years and years and years. And back before the electronic collar came out, and you had a young bird dog about 11 months old, and you took him out, and the first time the bird's wild covey flush, he'd break, take off, 
and he'd run up another bird and take off and take up another one. And the first thing you know, he's on one of the hunting preserves and one of the plantations in South Georgia. I kept a collar on my dog with Dr. Maddox and the phone number, and that's all I was on it. And I'd get called by the different owners, and we were looking for these dogs. So bird dogs occasionally get away too. These dogs here, they run their prey or their uh, animal, uh, the, the uh, game rather, a lot further. The quail usually go maybe a 1,000 yards, 2,000 yards, quarter of a mile, and you, you get them back because it's a general rule. And now with electric collars, we pretty well keep them in contact. But now Bob wants these dogs take off, and they get out of range and cross the O'Clockney River down in Cairo, then they're gone. So I just feel like this bill is helping to give some relief to these hunters who accidentally let a dog get away, and they're not responsible for it until they can get him back. Amen. So that's that's... I wonder if you got somebody across the Oaklockney River there that's a good friend of yours, a doctor friend that's contributed to your campaign, and it's every weekend that he has trouble with them. Well, we he's over there still hunting with his friends, with some of his other, some of your friends and his friends. He invites his in-laws up from uh, Atlanta to come down with him, and it's every weekend that they do it. They passionate about it, right. passionate about right. it. Right. Come down every weekend, and those dogs over there on the property running, they bow hunt. And you know when that dog runs through there and stirred up, there ain't much chance you're going to get a bow shot in a, in a while. Now, they uh, might be a chance. I know that. Well, I mean, what, how you feel about that? Well, I know that uh, it's bad on well, the property. Well, there's two sides of it. That's right. And these dogs, you got they, these dogs, uh, and they've done a good job. They, they use them more beagles that don't run as far. Right. They'll jump them and get them up and run them, and you, most of the time they're going to get a shot like that. But they come back. And that, they got to do some things like that. I, don't, I ain't saying all beagles and all, but it depends on what size club. You know, if you listen, look at that handout that you uh, that you got, the average club was 3,700 and something acres. I mean, you know, we've, we've said a lot today, but everything we said kind of fell right into the hands of the law we got because we ain't got many complaints. We got pretty good sized clubs. We've uh, the complaints are dropping down. They're working together better. But you're right about the dog. I mean, they can't control the dog, and I and I appreciate. It. Question, Jay. So, Bob, let me ask you this, Mr. Chairman. So you think that maybe we just may need to set a minimum fine, like a $25 fine or something like that? Well, I think you ought to. I, I don't say, I'm not going to say how much or anything, but I, I ask these fellas. I, I don't know. I mean, I think that might work. I think $250 is pretty stiff, I mean, in my opinion. I, I, but I didn't have anything to do with that. The department did. That's a judge sitting on the bench that makes that decision. And I guess they can go up to a thousand dollars, but it appears to me that some of them have been have been that. And it might be you got to make it enough; it ain't going to be a habit ever. I mean, you know, it's got to be some punishment. Yeah. I don't think ten to twenty-five dollars is quite enough, to be honest with you. But it, I think something like that could work. I'm not opposed to that. It's, it's not about the money at all. It's about it's about the DNR's right to pull our permit. There's several clubs I'm a member of. I'm, I'm Joshua Covenant from North Bryan County. Mr. Lane is my representative. I do not agree with what he's saying one bit. If we don't get this bill across, dog hunting for dog hunting for deer is going to die. Uh, there's no way you can keep the dog on the property every single time. But what happens? It's not about the money. You see how much money we spend. And you think we? You think the money's a big issue? Yeah. We're poor people. We scrounge just to do a tradition we love. But what happens is um, I'm a member of Lewis Hunting Club in North Bryan County. Not this past deer season, but the season before that, they received a probationary letter from the Department of Natural Resources. They had eight warning violations, if I'm not mistaken. All of them were for permanent dogs off permanent property. And they received a letter basically putting them on probation if they had any violation of any kind that they could have their permit completely revoked. And we're talking about 40 men. So that, that's that's where that's where the problem is. It's not about the money. We can put it. We can put the minimum fine, and it wouldn't matter. It's it's about the fact that that we're going to have thirty or forty or a hundred men's right to deer hunt on the tract of land pulled for one dog. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, and I think most everybody's here aware that. Uh, Bob Lane is very dedicated to the sport of hunting. Uh, Bob sits back there, uh, two seats down from me, long time friend, long time ag connected, go all the way back to, the, to our youth, mm -hmm. 
University of Georgia. Uh, with different awesome opinions, we've, we've got some different interpretations on this. But let me ask you this. First off, back to the point I made with the other, the only change that this law would make as far as the person retrieving his dog is that landowner would have to stand up there if this was to pass. Have to stand up there and deny you permission to come in and get your dog. No. It doesn't. It, this, this bill goes way further than that. It pretty much repeals. There's no enforcement, no permitting, no no anything without without the uh, without. Well, I mean, if this provision was passed, right now, you know, you can't. We got trespassing laws. We've had trespassing. In fact, we stiffened our trespassing laws, if you remember, uh, in recent years. Uh, not as strong as some states, but we. But that that really hadn't been a problem as, as lately. But most people don't, uh, that, that's not the problem they're having is somebody coming on there to retrieve the dog. The dog being on the property, just being on the property, getting lost is not a problem with the landowners. The problem is when you got a pack and you're trying to do something on your property yourself and somebody else, you know, the dog, dog more than one dog, it's usually a pack of dogs are on your property Con uh, consistently. You know, if it didn't happen, I mean, I mean really... And I, it is up to the discretion of the ranger, and that's probably something that Bill and them need to work on, is making sure that they know that if it's not a, a, a happens every day or every weekend. But, you know, what we were hearing was every time, some every weekend that they hunted, you know, it was a total disregard for the neighboring people, for, for the neighbors about the, the dogs getting on at night. They couldn't enjoy what they wanted to do. They the couldn't problem is not retrieving the dog the truck. The problem. Not retrieving it. Yeah. Retrieving it. Hell, they're glad to get them to come retrieve them. Now, that, now, some of them, well, they are at once they, once you have, once they know that you have been decided that, they, that you violated the law. Uh, and, and they might be some people, but, you know, a lot of that's caused by some of us, too, as deer hunters. And I grew up deer hunting with dogs. I hadn't done it in a long time, but I grew up, I went five or six years hunting deer with dogs. And it didn't see a deer. There wasn't a deer around, I don't believe. We'd hunt a 5,000 acre track. They'd put the dogs out, and, and the dogs would go into the wind, go that way, and I'd be this way. I wouldn't even hear a dog bark. I mean, I did it a bunch of times. But I still enjoyed it. I enjoyed the outdoors. I enjoyed being out there. I enjoyed, you know what I enjoyed most? Is going back to the campsite. When I got back there, somebody killed a big old nice pup. I said, Where in the world did he come from? I didn't know there's anything in these woods like that. Go back and hear all the tales. Here those old timers. Talk about, oh yeah, he jumped a ditch over there. That so and so and so and so and so and so was behind him, and I could hear, I knew he was coming. You know, hearing those kind of things. I mean, that is, and I'm telling y'all, it is a great sport. It's a great family sport. We got a lot of young people that's involved in it, and we want to get more of the young people involved in it. I'm worried about our young people. We, ain't, I'm worried about our hunters. Uh, you know, generations from now, and where they coming from, but. The other thing is, we living in a different world than we did back when I hunted like that. Well, we, it's a different world. It's different ownership. It's different partials, different size partials. It's different people on it. I mean, I, I know right there around me, uh, you know, the, my neighbors used to not ever care about uh, people running deer with dogs, but then it got divided up, and those people there now do, but they didn't. The old-timers didn't, but it's a different world, and, it, and I, you know, I don't know how you write a law that that covers every situation and does it good and everybody's happy with it. But that's the problem we in. But I want you to know I support you as dear dog hunters. I mean I do. I want y'all to continue to do it. But I don't know how you I mean y'all come up with a better way. Tell me a better way to do it than what we're doing. This is what y'all asked for because what ha what was happening, let me tell the committee this. What was happening is the whole county got eliminated. And people said, and, and, and what reason we got this bill right here is it they had four counties that had a higher number of complaints than anybody else. Scriven, Jenkins, Emanuel, and Cantor. And they took every landowner, the board did, or the department did, and gave it to the board. They took every landowner that had 10 acres or more in those counties. And then they got a phone number for them. They listed them, got a phone number for them, and they random sampled them. And called them. Deer hunters, deer dog hunters were involved in there as landowners. People that didn't hunt, uh, you know, every, everybody, anybody had 10 acres or more. They called them. And in all four of those counties, 
Scriven County was the one that had the less. They asked, do you favor deer hunting with dogs in Scriven County? 59% of people said no. And Jenkins, 63%. And Emmanuel, 73%. Kim, you might have to hit me on these because I don't know. And in Counter, 80%. 80% of people said they didn't favor deer hunting with dogs there. And so the board said, basically, at the meeting they had, when it all came to a head, said, now we, we've got this information. We know we got problems. We, haven't, we had a board member seating at that time that had... Uh, I thought it was 60 acres of land. I heard uh, David said, tell somebody it's 30 acres. But I heard it's 60 acres of pine, uh, planted pines burned up by deer dog hunters. We had people getting threatened. We had a, a Pierre, when he, uh, Howard, made the motion that we close half of the, ha close it up, close the season in half in those four counties. He, he talked about a guy in Jenkins County that got his arm broke before him and his grandson went up to check an automobile out that was on, up on their property and got up there, got in a fight, and got his arm broke with his grandson there. And hit Pierre basically slammed his fist down and said, I'm telling you, if we don't do something, we negligent in our, in our responsibilities. And I think he made the motion right then, am I right, David, to, to eliminate uh, deer hunting with dogs until the weekend after Thanksgiving. Well, those folks called me up and said, listen, man, we can't feed a dog all year and hunt him five weekends, five or six weekends. So you got to do something for us. And they came with the bill that we got. That's what we got. And so... Uh, I mean, I went to the board and I asked them, will y'all hold off on this motion if we can get something passed? And they said, yep, you get something passed that works, we'll hold off on the motion. But it's still there. It's still, I mean, the motion's out there, but the feeling is still there. If we don't do something about it, they will do something about it. And I dare say that we wouldn't have deer hunting with dogs probably today in a couple of those counties right now at all. I mean, there's a chance we would, but there's a chance we wouldn't have either. I mean, it could be eliminating all four of them. But that's what we we got two choices: do something like we're doing, or either uh, let leave it up to the board and let them eliminate them. And, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Too long. Can, can, we got one more fellow want to talk, uh, and we're supposed to be out of here at 11 o'clock because there's uh, another committee meeting. Oh, excuse me, 10:30. I'm sorry. <laughs> Dave. I'll be brief, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I can share a little of the history, but first of all, you know, I know a lot of these guys, I support deer dog hunting, have supported deer dog hunting all my life. First deer I ever killed was in Branton County hunting deer with dogs. And and that's, I grew up in Soapton, Georgia, but I had relatives in Branton County that I hunted with. I killed a deer running with dogs when I was 13, killed several in Branton County. So I, I know you know, what deer dog hunting's about. I've been there and done that. So I appreciate the problems we're trying to deal with here. Uh, and I think Bob Lane did a good job explaining the situation. Uh, if you guys pass this, this bill that you have, y'all pass it this year, you'll have this room and people all out in the hall next year, that'll be landowners here raising cane. They'd be here today if they'd have known about this. Because I'm already getting calls. I, I represent the Georgia Wildlife Federation. But I worked for DNR for 32 years, and I was a wildlife director from 1990 to 2003 when I retired. And during that whole time, I was a biologist uh, out of Thompson, and, and I had a district that I worked, which included Scriven, uh, or the dog hunting counties with Scriven, Burke, and Jenkins. And so I went out every year collecting deer job bones to try to get age structure deer and, and, you know, deer population management. Some of the best folks that I dealt with were the dog hunting groups down there. They would religiously take the jaw bones out, save them, set them on the porch, give me a key to the gate, say, here are the jaw bones. They wanted to help. So I fully support deer dog hunting. But what we had was a system in place where, as Bob mentioned, the, I sat there and watched counties close down. And it wasn't one club. There might be 10 or 15 or 20 clubs or more in a county when it was closed down because the dog, they weren't controlling their dogs. They were all over the joining landowners, and, and they just couldn't, the, the board couldn't handle it. And you guys can't handle it politically. That's a, at one point in time, it was a legislative issue. And, and it got too hot between dog hunters and landowners, so they tossed it to the DNR board to handle because they are unelected. 
And that's, that's how it got to the point where the DNR board was trying to regulate it. And it is a hot issue. I, back in the 70s, I was in a courthouse in Emanuel County in Swainsboro, Georgia. Half the room was dog hunters and half was landowners. And they had to bring deputy sheriffs and everything else. So this has been an ongoing problem. We've been working on this. When I was wildlife director, Ken Shockley can, can vouch for this. Ten years ago, I started telling dog hunters, you, we got to do something different, folks, because the, the DNR board would close a county, and I had some really good friends, some guys that I grew up with that loved dog hunting as much or more than anybody in this room in Washington County. Their dog club had never had a complaint, but they, when they closed the county, they're out of business. Y'all don't want to go back to that. I promise you, you don't want to go back there. I've been there. It's not in your best interest to go back there. Uh, so anyway, I think these folks don't realize what they're asking for. A lot of them don't know the history and weren't involved. Uh, I do know the history, and I was involved. And, and, and I'm like Bob Lane. The Georgia Wildlife Federation will sit down and work with any dog group, any landowner, any member of the General Assembly to try to find middle ground. But what we've seen is, you know, years ago when I was dog hunting, there were these huge tracts of land, all rural, Nobody cared. But what's happened, you know, you get people coming in, you get these estates broken up, you get people coming in and buying 10 acres of, of a little farmette or whatever, and they aren't used to dogs. And But I've got some really good friends, and I'm from Troopland County. They don't dog hunt there, but one of my best friends in Candler County, Bob said 80% of the landowners were opposed to deer dog hunting. He owns about 3,000 acres, been in his family for years, they only bow hunt. He's got a bunch of friends he was in college with. Some live in Florida from other states. They come down and spend long weekends deer hunting on his land, just as friends. They all bow hunt. He told me that every weekend of the season they had dogs all over. Well, you can't archery hunt, has been said, with dogs running on your property. Now what, now, what we put in place, or what you guys put in place three years ago, is working. I mean, I know these guys don't like it, but they don't want to go back to where we are. I've talked with a lot of other clubs that say, we're fine. We haven't had any problem. We, we don't have one problem with it. And the landowners, I, we haven't gotten a lot of complaints from the landowners. So I, I'm just telling you that if you pass this law, You'll have this room and several more full of people making complaints. I've been there for a bunch of years, and, and what we've got now has worked better than anything else. And I'm like Bob Lane. If somebody's got a better solution, toss it out there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, could I have 60 seconds to make one brief response? i keep it to 60 seconds. I'd be willing to bet anything that's legal, I don't want to do anything illegal, that if we pass this bill, this room will not be filled next year. And um, this is a very limited bill. It's being blown out of proportion. If you look, it just says the mere roaming or escape or pursuit of trailing the game by any dog used for hunting onto a track of property. That's all we're eliminating, the mere escape. If you want to tighten that language, you can, uh, we'll make it more restrictive. That's okay with me. That's all we're talking about. We're leaving the rest of the bill totally intact. And if that's not restrictive enough language, then I'm open to, to, to making it more restrictive. They said if they knew about it, the landowner had been up here. It's been out. I mean, we, we make this thing public. It's been known for days we're going to have this meeting. If they had a concern, they'd be here. I've been fighting this issue for three years, and I've had, I think, one landowner in my district call me concerned about it. This is not a, it's, this is not a major change. It's just giving a little bit of relief, and uh, I mean, it's just taking the cloud really away. And uh, it's uh, the right thing to do, and my 60 seconds are up. But uh, thank you for your support. Mr. Chairman, let me ask something, Tom. There's about three to four different versions of how to fix this thing floating around up here between lawyer to lawyer to farmer to farmer to vet to all that kind of stuff. we got a room in the morning already. That's what it's called, Pat. Let me let Mac, Pete, Dubose, Dr. Gene, and you meet with them sometime today 
And if you can get something worked out on some of this language that they have floating around up here, then we'll we'll get it out of here in the morning. Okay. And and then that'll still give you two shots at rule. That's the main concern I have. We can make adjustments, whatever needs to be made. I I I just want to make sure we don't lose our chance before rule. I, I do need to know something though, to make some of this language work. Basically, how many average? Just a quick answer. How many dogs y'all turn out at the time, and how many times do you go hunting during the year, during the season? But the majority of your hunting is done on Saturday. Some of your larger clubs may hunt one day during the week. The number of the dogs that's turned out at any one time depends on the size of your club and where you hunt. Uh, on a small club. Maybe five to ten dogs are turned out on the drive. On a huge club, where you're talking about maybe in West South Georgia, where you got nine, ten, twenty, thirty five naked clubs, they may turn out ten or fifteen dogs or twenty dogs at a time. Uh, it depends on the property where you hunt. If you hunt next to a problem area, they have limited it down on every club, turned out very few dogs. And, and one to two times a week? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, if that bunch that I just named off can get together and come up with something, Tommy. Okay. Thank you all very, very much for coming up here. It's a long ride. What time will the meeting be? I, you don't know yet. Nine o'clock in the morning okay. if y'all can get something worked out today.